Random House Audiobooks presents Dragonlance Chronicles, Volume 1, Dragons of Autumn Twilight, by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. Read for you by Peter McNichol. Hear the sage as his song descends. Hear the high tale of the Dragonlance. In ages deep, past memory and word, when three moons rose from the lap of the forest, dragons, terrible and great, made war on this world of Kryn. Flint Fireforge collapsed on a moss-covered boulder, his old dwarven eyes lingering fondly over the landscape of Solace. The Valenwood trees were ablaze in the season's brilliant reds and golds, and the azure sky was repeated in the waters of Crystal Mill Lake. As he rested, he pulled a block of wood from his pack and began whittling. Stupid quest, Flint grumbled to himself. Silliest thing I've ever done. After 148 years, I ought to have learned. A distant voice answered him. You'll never learn, dwarf. Squinting into the setting sun, Flint saw a figure striding up the path. Tennis? Is it you? The man had an elvish grace, yet his muscled body and reddish beard were definitely human. The same! The newcomer engulfed Flint in a hug that lifted him off the ground. Uh, put me down! <laughs> no respect for my age or station. I hope no one saw us. No one would remember us, Flint, Tannis grinned. Five years is a long time for humans. Remember, they don't live for hundreds of years like we do. The dwarf scowled. Why the beard? You were ugly enough. I've been in lands that were not friendly to elves. The beard hid my heritage. Flint sat back down and began to carve once more. I've been in lands that were not friendly to anyone. But we're home now, eh? <laughs> That's all behind us. Drawing a hood over his face to keep the setting sun out of his eyes, Tannis regarded his friend. I've heard there's a new high theocrat in Solace who's turned the town into a hotbed of fanaticism. Tannis's voice had grown deeper, Flint thought. And elves never change. But then Tannis was only half-elven. His mother had been raped by a human warrior in one of the wars that had divided the races of Kryn after the cataclysm. Flint turned the piece of wood in his hands, unsatisfied. Bah! The high seekers in Haven are still virtuous. It's just one rotten apple in Solace who's spoiling the barrel. Five years earlier, Flint, Tannis, and their other friends from Solace Town had parted from each other to go off on separate quests. Each wanted to do his part to bring the world out of the age of despair and into a new age of hope by finding some sign of the ancient true gods who had disappeared and been all but forgotten ever since the cataclysm. Three hundred years earlier. Stern Brightblade, the young knight of Salamnia, had traveled north to his homeland in search of his vanished father. Raislin, the young mage, and his warrior twin Caramon had gone off to the Tower of High Sorcery in Wayworth, where Raislin planned to take the dreaded tests of wizardry, which, if he passed them, would make him a true wizard. The twin's half-sister, the swordswoman, Kitiara, had gone off with Sturm, in search of a warrior father who had also disappeared in the Northlands. As for Tesselhoff Burfoot, well, one never knew where a kinder would go. Their race was afflicted with wanderlust. Tannis only hoped Tass remembered that the five years were up and it was time for the friends to hold their reunion at the inn of the last home in Solace. The white-haired dwarf stared hard at the half-elf. Tell me, Tannis. Did you find what you were looking for on your quest? Danis raised an eyebrow and regarded his old friend. You ask if I found a sign of the ancient gods? Sadly, I did not, he answered. I heard tales of healing, but it was all trickery, as I knew from what Raislin had taught me of magic. What of you, Flint? How was the journey to your homelands? The dwarf glanced up at Tanis. I should never have gone. Suddenly, Tanis held up a warning hand. Over in that grove. Who goes there? A high voice answered. We are the spirits of those poor souls Flint Fireforge left on the barroom floor. 
We died of shame for not being able to outdrink a hill dwarf. Tannis burst out laughing, while Flint's beard quivered in rage. Catch the love, Burfoot! There was a rustle in the underbrush. Then the little Kender emerged. Kender were a race considered by many on Kryn to be as much a nuisance as mosquitoes, especially since they were able pilferers of other people's property. Small-boned, Kender rarely grew over four feet tall. This particular one wore bright blue leggings under a homespun tunic. His brown eyes glinted with mischief, and his childlike smile seemed to reach to the tips of his pointed ears. Tasselhoff ran forward, the top knot of hair on his head bouncing as he threw his arms around Flint. Flint returned the embrace reluctantly and stepped back. Tass turned eagerly to Tannis, holding out his short arms for a hug. No thanks, Tannis grinned. I want to keep my money pouch. Alarmed, Flint felt under his tunic. You rascal! He leaped on the kender, and the two went down in the dust. Tannis started to pull Flint off, then he stopped suddenly. Too late, he heard the whinny of a horse. He turned and saw a figure emerging from the shadows. Gray mottled skin sagged about the rider's face. A peculiar odor hit Tannis, and he wrinkled his nose in disgust. Hobgoblin! Flint and Taz quickly scrambled to their feet. The hobgoblin sneered as five goblin guards emerged from the trees. I'm Fumas Saturday. You have no right to be walking in city limits. You're under arrest. He leaned down and said to the goblin nearest him, Bring me the blue crystal staff if you find it. If they resist, kill them. With that, he galloped off. Flint reached for his battle axe. Hobgoblins and solace? This theocrat has much to answer for. Tannis drew his sword. I advise you to retreat, goblins. We're tired and hungry, and we have no intention of being arrested. The goblins glanced at each other nervously, but drew their long, curved blades. Flint advanced, and a goblin dove at him. The dwarf swung his axe, and a goblin head rolled into the dust. Tannis skillfully met the clumsy stab of another goblin. The swords crossed, and Tannis shoved it backward. You slime work for the high theocrat? The goblin gurgled with laughter, then ran wildly at Tannis. That fool, Hedrick! Not on your life! Our few master works for the... Oh! The creature impaled itself on Tannis' sword. Tannis grimaced in disgust at the stinking body. Damn! I didn't want to kill it. Just find out who hired it. Another goblin sprang at Flint. Instantly, Tasselhoff whipped out a dagger and threw it. Thick black blood oozed from the goblin as it fell. There was a sound of flapping feet as the remaining goblins fled. Arching an eyebrow, Flint turned to Tannis and Tass. Well, are we going to stay near this stench all night? Let's get to the inn. The inn of the last home, set high in an ancient Valenwood tree, like all the houses in Solace, was known throughout Kryn as a traveler's refuge and center for news. On the stairs leading up to it, Tannis noticed that people glanced at him and his companions with suspicion, not with the welcoming looks they would have given five years ago. A touch on Tannis's arm interrupted his thoughts. He turned and saw Flint silently pointing at armed men marching below. Tannis flung the door open. Our friends will know what's going on. If they're here, a wave of light, noise, heat, and the familiar smell of spicy potatoes hit them full in the face. Tasselhoff's quick eyes swept the crowd. There's Karaman, he cried, dashing across the room to the warrior. Wading through a sea of belt buckles, Flint followed. Karaman better look to his purse. Tannis walked behind him, smiling. If Karaman had come, then Raceland would be here too. The twins were never far apart. Where's your brother, Karaman? Tannis asked the large warrior after they clasped hands and hugged. Karaman nodded toward the end of the table, where a slight figure was huddled in the red robes that signified his neutrality in the struggle between good and evil. In the world of Kryn, the white-robed mages devoted their lives to good, the black-robed ones to evil. But the red robes were the mages of neutrality who helped balance these two potent forces. I warn you, Tennis, Karaman murmured. He's changed. Basil looked up. Tannis, he said weakly. Tannis gazed at him in horror. Raceland's skin had turned a brassy metallic color. His once blue irises now glittered gold, and the round black pupils were now the shape of hourglasses. Raceland smiled. I see my appearance startles you. His voice was a raspy whisper. 
Tanner swallowed hard. In the name of the true gods. Raceland. Plopping down next to Tannis, Flint's eyes widened as he stared at the mage. Great Reorks, are you cursed? Raceland shook his head. I passed the tests, he told them proudly. Had I failed, I would have died. As it was, my health was the price. He coughed horribly, spitting up blood. Imagine my pride, half-elf. And imagine the power I acquired when I passed the test. Though I traded in my bodily health to get it, I have power now. Deep, magical power. These hourglass pupils of mine, for instance, they see time as it affects all things. Even now, I see you dying, Tannis. Slowly, by inches. And so I see every living thing. It's a heavy burden, Tannis. But I have power now. And I have the enchanted staff of Magius. Tannis looked down at the plain wooden staff in Raceland's hand. A ball of clear crystal clutched in a golden dragon's claw gleamed at the top. Flint licked his lips as if he would wash a bad taste out of his mouth. Let's have some ale here. A tall, red-haired girl appeared through the crowd, carrying a tray of mugs. Caramon grinned. Guess who this is? And I'll buy the round. Flint slammed his fist on the table. You're buying, you big oaf. It's Tika. Tika Whalen. The pretty barmaid's green eyes twinkled with fun. I was only 14 when you all left. By the way, Tannis, she reached in her pocket and drew forth a scroll. This arrived for you today. Under strange circumstances, Tannis unrolled the parchment and read it. <sighs> it's from Kitty Ara. She's not coming. There was a moment's silence. Then Flint shook his head. Yeah, that's done it. The circle is broken. Bad luck. Bad luck. Tannis licked his dry lips. She says her duties with her new lord keep her busy. She sends regrets to all of us and her love to, uh, to... <clears throat> That's all she says. What new lord does she mean, do you think? Raceland shrugged his thin shoulders. Who knows with Kitiara? My half-sister is, um, after all, a mercenary. The last time we saw her, five years ago, she was going north with Sturm. Tannis looked up at Tika. You say this arrived under unusual circumstances. Tell me. Tika shivered. A strange man brought it in. He was wrapped from head to foot in cloth, and I couldn't see his face. That old geezer was here when he came in, too. She gestured to an old man sitting by the fire, telling stories to a dreamy-eyed boy. Flint touched Tannis on the arm. Here comes one who can tell us more. Tannis turned toward the door. Sturm! The straight-backed Salamnic knight, in antique armor and chain mail, held the door open for a tall man and a woman, heavily cloaked in furs. Tass pointed at them. They're barbarians from the plains, the Quashu tribe. Apparently, the two declined any offer Sturm made, for the knight bowed again and left them. Preening his large mustaches, he walked across the room and threw his arms around Tannis. Then he turned to greet the others. But his face grew solemn as he took in the mage. Raceland? Flint rumphed. It's him all right. Well, we're all here. What news? Sturm looked over at Tannis questioningly. Where's Kitty Ara? We were hoping you could tell us, Tannis said. The knight frowned. Oh, not I. We parted soon after crossing into Salamnia. She was going to look up relatives of her father. Tannis sighed. Well, that's that. What of you, Sturm? Did you find your father? Sturm began to answer, but Tannis only half listened. His thoughts were on Kitty Ara. After five years of trying to get her dark eyes and crooked smile out of his mind, his longing for her grew daily. Wild, impetuous, and hot-tempered, the swordswoman was everything 
Tannis was not. She was also human, and love between human and elf always ended in tragedy. Yet Tannis could no more get Kitty R out of his head than he could get his human half out of his blood. Sturm caressed the hilt of his sword lovingly. No one knows where my father is or if he's alive. As for my inheritance, I wear it, my armor, and my weapon. Tass interrupted him. Who are those people you came in with? Tannis looked up as the two barbarians took seats in the shadows of the corner. The man was tall. Tannis had never seen a man as tall, and his eyes seemed dark and haunted. His companion, the woman Sturm had bowed to, was hidden under a fur cape and hood. She carried a plain staff trimmed with feathers in barbarian fashion. I found them wandering, exhausted on the road outside of town. Sturm explained. So I brought them here to get food and a bed for the night. They would have refused help, but there are things on the road these days that it is better not to face in the dark. Tannis nodded grimly. We met some of them, asking about a blue staff. He described their encounter with Fu Master Toady. Sturm nodded. A seeker god questioned me about a blue staff outside. Blue crystal, wasn't it? Tannis stroked his beard thoughtfully. What's so important about a blue crystal staff that goblins will kill to get it? I don't know. Sturm shrugged. But there are rumors of worse to come. Rumors of armies gathering in the north. Armies of strange creatures, not human. Caramon broke in. I too have heard such things. In fact, as the conversation continued, Tasselhoff yawned and turned away. Easily bored, he looked around the inn for some amusement. His eyes went to the old man, still spinning tales to the child by the fire. The barbarians were listening too. Then Tass's jaw dropped, and he stared in admiration. The Quaishu woman had thrown her hood back, and the firelight shone on her. Her face was like marble, and no jeweler could have created the effect of her silvery gold hair shimmering in the firelight. Her eyes were the blue of delicate wildflowers growing in the desert. Tika, passing by, pointed to a man in seeker's robes frowning at a nearby table. "That's Hedrick, the High Theocrat," she whispered. The friends turned to look, but all were immediately overwhelmed by the beauty of the plainswoman. The old man's voice carried clearly over the drone of conversation. "My stories of the ancient gods are true, child." He glanced at the woman and her escort. "Ask these two." They carry such stories in their hearts. The boy turned to the woman eagerly. Can you tell me a story? The woman raised her hand in a gesture of protest. I'm sorry, I'm not a teller of tales. The old man looked directly into the woman's soft blue eyes. But you are a singer of songs, aren't you, chieftain's daughter? Sing the child your song, Gold Moon. From out of nowhere, a lute appeared in his hands. He gave it to the woman, who stared at him in fear and astonishment.、Uh, how, how, how do you know me, sir? The old man smiled gently. It's not important. Sing. Slowly, as if in a trance, she began to strum the lute. Gold Moon, the princess. Loves a poor man's son. Her father forbids it. The summer sings on. The chieftain sends river wind east and away to search for the true gods. The sky's rim is gray. River wind comes back with a staff of blue flame. The chieftain makes mockery of river wind's claim. He orders him stoned. He orders him banished. The girl joins her lover. The staff flares. They vanish. There was heavy silence in the room as her hand plucked the final chord. Taking a deep breath, she handed the lute back to the old man. "Thank you, my dear," he said, smiling and turning to the child. "And now for the story you asked for, little one. Once upon a time, there was a solemnic knight called Humor." Who worshipped the great god of good, Paladine? 
Paladine? The child was wide-eyed. I've never heard of a god named Paladine. Paladine is one of the ancient gods, child, the man answered. After the dark days of the cataclysm, people stopped worshipping him. They blamed the destruction of the world on the gods instead of on themselves, as they should have done. Have you ever heard the canticle of the dragon? Oh, yes, the boy sat up eagerly. Papa says dragons aren't real, but I want to see one someday. The old man's face grew sorrowful. Be careful what you wish, my child. Anyway, once upon a time the great knight, Humor, was lost in the forest. And he prayed to Paladine for help. Suddenly there appeared before him a white stag. Hedrick, the high theocrat who'd had too much ale, rose to his feet. Blasphemy! Corrupting our youth! Guards! Arrest this man and this woman for singing lewd songs! I'll confiscate the witch's staff, too! Hedrick lurched across the floor and reached clumsily for the staff, but the woman held it fast. No! It is mine! Her tall companion rose to his feet and pushed the high theocrat, knocking him off balance. He tripped over his robes and fell head first into the roaring fire. There was a whoosh, a flare, then the smell of burning flesh. The old man quickly grabbed the barbarian woman's staff and handed it to Tasselhoff. Here, yeah, knock the theocrat down! Tasselhoff swung the staff squarely at Hedrick's chest. The flames died instantly. Hedrick's robes were whole again and undamaged. His skin was pink and healthy. The old man turned to the crowd and cried. The staff, it healed him. Tasselhoff's eyes went to the staff in his hands. It was made of blue crystal and it was glowing with a bright blue light. The old man who had told the stories began shouting, Arrest the kinder! Arrest the barbarians! Arrest their friends! They came in with this knight! He pointed at Sturm. Tanis leaped up. What? Are you crazy, old man? Whose side are you on, anyway? Hedrick staggered to his feet. You will burn, witch! Guards! Tika came running over to Tanis. You've got to get out of here. The whole town's been hunting for that staff. Those hooded men told the theocrat they'd destroy Solace if they caught anyone hiding it. Tanis glared at the old man, who only grinned and winked mysteriously. Tika wrung her hands as shouts came from below. The guards are coming. You'll have to go out through the kitchen. In an instant, Tanis, Karaman, Raceland, Flint, and Tasselhoff were all on the move. Years of being apart had not affected the friend's ability to react as a team to danger. Only Sturm sat, calmly drinking his ale. The knight's code of honor forbade him to run from danger. Sturm, Tannis cried, thinking fast. There's a lady to protect. Sturm stood up at once. The lady? Of course. He walked over to the beautiful barbarian. Madam, your servant. It seems we're all in this together. We would be honored to accompany you and your gallant friend and guard your lives. Tika tugged on Tannis's arm. Go! Hide at my house. Tasselhoff was rooted to the floor, staring at the staff, which had faded back to a nondescript brown color. Tika grabbed Tass by his topknot and pulled him toward the kitchen. The kender shrieked, dropping the staff. The barbarian woman swiftly picked it up. We will go with you, she told Sturm. Thank you. The rear exit was only a hole with a rope leading down to the ground. They all slid down, except for Raceland, who said a few words of magic and floated to the ground, to everyone's astonishment. His new powers certainly were impressive. Tannis went last, but he slipped on the rope and cut his hands badly. When they reached Tika's house in the trees, Tasselhoff, using one of his kender skills, picked the lock with ease, and they all crowded inside. Tannis sat down and turned his eyes to the barbarian woman, whom the old man had called by the name of Gold Moon. According to her song, she was a chieftain's daughter of the Kueishu tribe of barbarians who lived on the eastern plains. Tanis stared at the woman's incredible blue eyes and silver gold hair. Then his eyes went to his own bleeding palms. Blue crystal staff, he said to the woman. It healed the theocrat. How? She faltered. I... I do not know. 
Tannis held out his hands to her, and the woman touched him with the staff. It began to glow blue. Tannis felt a tingle. He watched in amazement as the blood on his palms vanished. The skin became smooth and unscarred, and the pain left him completely. True healing, he murmured in awe. Raceland stared intently at the woman holding the blue crystal staff. If she's a charlatan, she's a good one. With a scowl, the tall barbarian stepped toward Raceland. Worm, she's Gold Moon, the Quaishu chieftain's daughter who will inherit his throne. You dare to call her charlatan? The woman laid a gentle hand on the man's arm. Riverwind, please. They do not trust us because they do not know us. Raceland held out his hand. If I might examine it, Gold Moon offered the staff. But when Raceland touched it, there was a bright flash of blue light and a crackling sound. The mage jerked his hand back, crying out in pain. Tannis stared in amazement. A staff that heals and injures at the same time? Raceland licked his lips, his eyes glittering. It merely knows its own. Watch, Caravan, take the staff. The warrior drew back as if from a snake. Not me. Take the staff, his twin demanded, reluctantly. Caramon stretched out a trembling hand and touched the staff. Nothing happened. He gripped it, lifted it in his huge hand, and grinned. See there, Raceland gestured like an illusionist showing off a trick. Only those of simple goodness, pure in heart, may touch a sacred staff of healing. Tannis nodded. It is the sign we have been searching for, the sign of the ancient true gods. The kender, who was standing at the window, suddenly put a finger to his lips. Hush! The theocrats' gods! No one spoke. They could all hear goblin footsteps flapping on the bridge walks that ran among the branches of the Valenwood trees. Looking at the door, Tannis saw that it stood slightly open. The door! Caramon! But the warrior had already moved over to stand behind it, his giant hands flexing. The footsteps came to a stop. The seekers demand right of entry! A goblin head appeared in the door. Its eyes focused on Raceland, sitting calmly, the staff of mages on his shoulder. Oh ho! Look what we found! A staff! <laughs> Hand it over! The goblin took a step toward Raceland, who held out his staff. Certainly, he whispered. Shirak! The crystal ball flared into light. The goblins shrieked and shut their eyes, fumbling for their swords. At that moment, Caramon knocked their heads together with a sickening thud. The two goblins sank slowly to the floor where they lay motionless. Caramon stared down at them. I'm afraid I've killed them, he said. Tannis was thinking fast. We've got to get out of Solace. We'll escort Goldmoon and a friend to the crossroads, where they may continue toward Haven if they wish. Then, I think we should travel north to see if these rumors of armies are true. Sturm patted him on the arm. Tannis, we follow you, as always. Caramon nodded, and Raceland was already heading for the door, while Tass hurriedly raided Tika's pantry for food. The Kenda tossed Flint a wineskin to carry. Tannis held the door open, and Goldmoon touched him gently on the arm. We will come with you. Please accept our gratitude. You risked your lives for us, and we are strangers. Tannis clasped her hand. I'm Tannis. Let me introduce you to my companions. Uh, the brothers are twins. The big one is named Caramon. The mage is Raceland. The knight is Storm Brightblade. The dwarf Flint Fireforge carries the wine. And the kender Tasselhoff Burfoot is our clever locksmith. As friends, we have traveled together for many years, seeking to find new hope for this dismal world. You are Goldmoon, and he is Riverwind. There, we are strangers no longer. As the red moon Lunatari rose in the sky to join Solinari, its silvery sister moon, Tanis and his friends fled Solace, crossing Crystalmere Lake by boat. From the water's edge, hordes of hobgoblins shot hundreds of arrows at them. With the aid of Raistlin's sorcery, however, the arrows dropped harmlessly into the water, and the friends escaped unharmed. But as they crossed the lake, they saw a terrible omen in the sky. 
Two constellations were missing, the Queen of Darkness and the Valiant Warrior. Raistlin explained that the absence of the constellations meant war, death, and destruction on their planet, Kryn. The companions found shelter in a cave on the west side of the lake. There, they consulted their maps to determine the best way to Haven. There were two ways, by Haven Road and through Darken Wood, where the dead were said to walk. Since no one had ever returned from Darken Wood, Tanis and the others agreed to travel via the Haven Road. As they tramped down the road, which was eerily deserted, Goldmoon told Tanis how she and Riverwind had come to solace. The story of my song was true, Tanis, Goldmoon said. You see, Riverwind is not of royal blood, so my father, hoping he would never come back, sent Riverwind on an impossible quest to find a holy object of the ancient gods. When Riverwind returned, he raved about a broken city where death had black wings, and about a holy woman dressed in blue light who gave him the staff I now carry. My father was astounded, but when the staff did nothing for him, he proclaimed Riverwind a fraud and ordered him stoned. I couldn't bear to see the stones flying at Riverwind. I ran to him, and the rocks struck us both. Then there was a blinding flash, and when we could see again, the staff was glowing blue, and we were on the road near Solace. Tanis turned to Riverwind. What do you remember of this broken city? Where was it? Riverwind shook his head. My journey is like a dark dream. The city was once beautiful with white marble buildings. But then it was destroyed, as if a great hand had picked it up and cast it down a mountainside. Now it's evil. Death came there on black wings, and its creatures worshipped it, shrieking and howling. The plainsman's face paled beneath his sunburnt skin. Tannis, Tannis, cried the kinder, who had run up ahead. There's a party of clerics coming this way. Sturm sniffed. I believe we can handle a party of clerics. Tass looked dubious. I don't know. These clerics gave me an eerie feeling. Tannis glanced at Sturm. Both of them knew that Kinder were not capable of feeling fear. Tannis couldn't remember when the sight of any being on Kryn had ever given Tass an eerie feeling. Here they come, Tannis said suddenly. He and the others moved back into the shadows of the trees as the clerics approached slowly, dragging a large handcart behind them. Tannis leaned over to Sturm. Maybe you should talk to them. Nodding, the knight stepped onto the road as the companions waited in silence. Tannis had never seen anything like these clerics. Long hooded robes shrouded their bodies, and their feet and hands were wrapped in cloth, like bandages. As they neared Sturm, they glanced around warily. Hail, Knight of Salamnia! The cleric's voice was inhuman. Tana shivered. Greetings, brethren, Sturm answered. Where do you come from? We travel from Haven. Driven by necessity on this chill, bitter day, the cleric answered. We seek a sacred staff of healing, a blue crystal staff. One of our brothers is sorely ill. He will die without the touch of this holy relic. Sturm tried to look through the wrappings of the cleric's eyes. A staff of healing would be of great value. How did you come to lose such a rare and wonderful object? The staff was stolen from our holy order. We tracked the foul thief to a barbarian village, then lost his trail. There are rumors of strange doings in Solace, however. So now we go there. Sturm looked down at the road. I'm afraid I cannot help. Suddenly a voice rang out behind Tannis. I can help you. Goldmoon, no! Tannis whispered too late. The princess was walking determinedly onto the road, followed by Riverwind. Caramon plunged after them. Blindsmen aren't leaving me behind in a ditch while they have all the fun. Tannis dragged Taz back as he was about to leap out, too. Has everyone gone mad? Flint, watch the kinder. Raceland. No need to worry about me, the mage whispered. I have no intention of going out there. 
Well, then, stay here. Tannis rose to his feet and slowly started forward, an eerie feeling creeping over him. The strange clerics filled Goldmoon with loathing, but they clearly knew something about his staff. I am the bearer of the staff, she told them. But it was not stolen. It was given. Riverwind stepped to one side of her, Sturm to the other. Caramon came charging through the brush and stood behind her. Goldmoon clasped the staff to her body. I will do what I can to help your dying brother, but I will not relinquish the staff unless I am convinced of your rightful claim to it. Annoyed, the cleric glanced back at his fellows, who made nervous gestures toward their wide cloth belts. Tannis strung his bow and waited. The cleric finally bowed his head in submission, folding his hands in his sleeves. We will be grateful for whatever aid you can give our poor brother. Then I hope you and your companions will return with us to Haven to be convinced that the staff has come into your possession wrongly. Goldmoon and Riverwind followed the cleric to the back of the cart. Caramon and Storm remained near the front. The cleric, in back, bowed to Goldmoon, then lifted up a cloth covering the back of the cart. Holding the staff in front of her, Goldmoon peered in and screamed. The cleric lifted a horn to his lips and blew long, wailing notes. Tannis raised his bow. Caramon, Sturm, he shouted. It's a trap! A great weight dropping on him stopped the half-elf. Strong hands groped for his throat, shoving his face deep into the wet leaves and mud. Tannis fought to breathe, but his nose and mouth were filled with mud. Then he heard a hoarse cry and a bone-crunching thump. Wiping mud from his face, he looked up to see Flint with a log in his hand. But the dwarf's eyes were not on him. They were on the body at his feet. Tannis recoiled in horror. It wasn't a man. Leathery wings sprang from its scaly back, and its face looked as though some malevolent being had twisted a human face into that of a reptile. Raceland approached them. By all the gods! What is that? Before Tannis could answer, he saw out of the corner of his eye a flash of blue light and heard Goldmoon calling. For one instant, as Goldmoon had looked into the cart, she had wondered what terrible disease could turn a man's flesh into scales. She had moved forward to touch the pitiful cleric with her staff, but the creature had sprung at her, grasping for the staff with a clawed hand. There was a blinding flash of blue, and the creature shrieked in pain, wringing its blackened hand. Riverwind, sword drawn, leaped in front of Goldmoon, but his sword fell as he gazed in terror at the thing in the cart. Rough, scaly hands grabbed Goldmoon from behind. She kicked backward, and the grip was eased. Whirling, she swung her staff in a wide arc, holding them at bay. But for how long? Riverwind! Goldmoon's cry woke the plainsman from his terror. He saw her backing into the forest, keeping the clerics away with her staff. He grabbed one and threw it heavily to the ground. Another jumped at Riverwind, while a third leaped toward Goldmoon. There was another blinding blue flash. Lunging forward, Sturm went to back up Riverwind, just as the creature grabbed a battle axe and sprang at the barbarian. Sturm plunged his sword into the creature's back. The thing screamed and wrapped its arms around the startled knight, toppling him to the ground, where his head hit a sharp rock. Red blood poured down Sturm's face, blinding him. Then the screaming stopped, and the knight saw the monster go rigid. The knight shoved the body over and tried to pull his sword from the creature's back. The weapon didn't budge. Sturm gasped. The thing had turned to stone. Sturm called out to Caramon as another cleric leaped at him, swinging an axe. The warrior ducked just in time. Raising his sword, Caramon struck back, squarely hitting the creature. A foul, rotting stench filled the air as a sickly green stain appeared on the cleric's robes. But the wound appeared to enrage the creature, who lunged at Caramon again. For a moment, panic engulfed the warrior. Then he heard a reassuring whisper. I'm here, my brother, Raceland said calmly. Ast to sark, Simirelon. The creatures stopped their wild rush, shaking their heads groggily. But within moments, they had regained their senses and started forward again. Magic resistant, Raceland murmured in awe. But that brief interlude of near sleep was enough for Caramon. Encircling their necks with his huge hands, Caramon swept their heads together. The bodies tumbled to the ground. Lifeless statues. Tannis swung his sword and struck the creature that had Sturm pinned to the ground. The cleric fell over with a shriek. 
Looking down the road, Tannis could see more creatures swarming out of the woods and heading toward them. He turned to Flint and Tasselhoff, who had run up behind him. Stay here, and guard Sturm while I get everyone together. We'll head back into the woods. Then he heard Raceland chanting another spell. A fireball leaped from the mage's fingers and flew straight past him toward the cart. Instantly, the wooden cart caught fire. Goldmoon was still fending off the creatures with his staff. Riverwind used his bow and arrow. Come this way, Tannis called to them. In moments, they were back in the shelter of the hedges. The cart was blazing now. Down the road, Tannis saw dark winged forms floating to the ground about a half mile away in both directions. Unless he and his friends escaped into the woods, they'd be trapped. Just then, Tash showed up, dragging Stern's sword. Guess what, Tannis? The thing turned to dust. Tannis sighed and looked over at Sturm, whose wound had stopped bleeding. Did the staff heal him? Goldmoon nodded. Enough so that he can walk. It has limits, Raceland said with a wheeze. Tannis nodded. Well, we're heading south, into the woods. Caramon shook his head. That's dark and wood, Tannis. You once said you'd rather fight the living than the dead, Tannis said. How do you feel about that now? The warrior did not answer. The companions stumbled through the thick woods as fast as they could and soon reached a game trail. Flint was puzzled. Why aren't they chasing us? Tannis had been wondering the same thing. I have a feeling they don't need to. They probably blocked all the exits from this forest. Except Darken Wood. Goldmoon shivered. Is it truly necessary to go that way? Tannis considered. It may not be. We'll get a look around from Prayer's Eye Peak. He went over to the shaken Riverwind. You've fought those creatures before, haven't you, Riverwind? The plainsman nodded. Yes, Tannis. In the broken city, it all came back to me when I looked inside the cart. At least I know now that I'm not insane. Those horrible creatures really exist. And they're spreading all over Kryn, Tannis added grimly. Goldmoon laid her cheek on Riverwind's tunic sleeve, slipping her hand around his arm. Do you think they were telling the truth? That they had been to our village? Riverwind gently took her hand. Don't worry. Our warriors could deal with them. He turned to the others, a look of gratitude in his sad eyes. Twice you've saved our lives. I thank you all. The companions, led by the vision of a white stag, which revealed itself to Storm, entered Darken Wood. There, at nightfall, the stag disappeared. The companions suddenly found themselves surrounded by skeletal warriors. These were the undead souls of knights who had failed in their lives' missions. They guarded the wood from all who entered with evil intentions. The companions had to convince the spectral troops that they meant no harm. They called upon Raistlin to communicate for them. He went into a trance and spoke to the skeletal warriors in a voice not his own, a deep, full-bodied voice. Amazingly, the specters bowed down before him. They summoned a troop of centaurs who escorted the companions to their leader, a unicorn known as the Forest Master. She ruled over Darken Wood and all those who entered it. When the companions told the Forest Master of their mission and their flight from the Lizard Men, she welcomed them and prepared a feast for them. Caramon apologized before eating the tasty venison, realizing that the deer must have been one of the Forest Master's subjects. But the unicorn assured him that by providing sustenance, the deer fulfilled its purpose in life, and therefore was not to be mourned. The Forest Master then told the companions that she had seen in a vision a great and shining being who told her of the lizard men who were called Draconians. This being had also told her that the one bearing the blue crystal staff would come that night to darken wood. The forest master was to give the bearer a message. In two days, Gold Moon and her companions must be in the ancient city of Zaxaraf. The city had been ruined during the cataclysm, when the gods hurled the fiery mountain down upon the city of Istar. The waters rushed in to fill the void. These waters, now called New Sea, also engulfed Zaxaraf. But the companions were nevertheless to go there, and, according to the Forest Master's vision, if they proved worthy, they would receive the greatest gift ever given to man. This presented a problem. 
Zaxaroth was too far to reach in just two days. But the forest master summoned a troop of Pegasi, and the flying horses immediately set off with the companions on their backs. Tanis and the others, exhausted from their travels, soon fell asleep as the Pegasi flew them toward the East Wall Mountains, beyond which lay Zaxaroth and their destiny. Tanis woke to find that he was lying in a grassy meadow. Beside him were their weapons, along with several days' worth of provisions. The leader of the Pegasi stood above him, staring off to the east. I'm sorry, he explained. There is trouble in the east. We can take you no farther. We must return home now. He spread his great wings. Wait! Tanis scrambled to his feet. What trouble? But the Pegasus was gone. The half-elf looked east. On the horizon rose the East Wall Mountains, gateway to Zaxaroth. At the foot of the mountains, snaking up to meet the morning sun, were three columns of greasy black smoke. Tanis ran over and shook Riverwind. Seeing Tanis's dark expression, the barbarian was instantly awake. What's this? We're in the plains? My village lies not far from here. Oh! He gave a ragged cry as he saw the smoke. Our village is burning! Gold Moon jerked awake, following his horrified stare. My people! My father! Flint, Tass, Caramon, and Sturm awoke, and Tanis explained quickly where they were. Gold Moon stared at them, her eyes cold and blue as the morning sky. Then she started determinedly through the tall grass toward the smoke rising from her village, and the others fell in behind her. Though Tanis had lived through much that was horrible in his life, the ravaged town of Kweishu would always stand out in his memory as a symbol of the horrors of war. The companions found great stone walls, huge temples, and spacious buildings there, all melted like butter on a hot day. Blackened bodies lay everywhere. Gazing at it, Tanis could only ask himself what fire existed on Kryn that could melt rock. In front of a temple, a row of hobgoblin corpses were hung on chains from a crude gibbet. A sign below them said, Obey me, or die. It was signed, Verminard. Verminard. The name meant nothing to Tanis. Later, he would remember Gold Moon standing in the ruins of her father's house, trying to put back together the pieces of a broken vase. Later, he recalled a dog curled around the body of a dead child. Later, he remembered Riverwind staring listlessly at his burned and blasted village, and Sturm moving his lips in a silent vow. He remembered the sorrow-lined face of the dwarf as he patted Tasselhoff on the back, trying to comfort the little kinder. He remembered the mage's voice saying, Tennis, we must reach Zaxaroth. Then we'll have our revenge. And so they left Kweishu. They traveled far into the night, each pushing his body to the point of exhaustion, so that when they slept, there would be no evil dreams. But the dreams came anyway. The next day, their thoughts were still on the ruined barbarian village as they crossed the East Wall Mountains. Raceland stared at the blue crystal staff. How precious the staff has become, now that it has been purchased by the blood of innocence. They had only two days to get to Zaxaroth if they were to receive the precious gift she told them of. They traveled a few miles on the old broken road, but then it turned spongy and dumped them literally into a swamp. Tanis gestured at the murky water. We can't walk through this. We'll have to turn back. The blood seemed to leave Riverwind's face. We can get through. I know a path. It leads to a broken city of evil. Raceland's hourglass eyes glittered. Zaxaroth. It makes sense, Tennis said. Where else would we go to find answers about the staff, except to where it was given you? Weary and discouraged, the companions soon found themselves wading through the muck again. They stopped to warm up by drinking some wine. When they started off again, a drunken Flint and Tasselhoff ventured far ahead of the others. The drunken pair soon came to a body of water with an enormous tree lying across it. They began to cross but soon found themselves facing magic-using draconians. Flint tumbled into the water. Tasselhoff fished him out and ran to alert the others. His warning came too late, though. The draconians had already plunged the area into a magical darkness. Suddenly the companions were covered in a gooey substance, and an unnatural sleep overcame them. 
Tasselhoff and Flint watched helplessly as their unconscious friends were carried off by the draconians. Keeping to the reeds, the kender and the dwarf followed, unseen. When night fell, they crept up on the draconian camp. The enemy was in the middle of a huge celebration. Great Reox! A dragon! Flint pointed a shaking finger. He and the kender watched in amazed horror as the draconians danced and prostrated themselves before a giant black dragon. Goldmoon's staff lay on the ground before it. Flint, there's something strange about that dragon, Taz whispered. I thought dragons were more lively, you know. Flint snorted. You want to see lively? Go tickle its foot! Before the dwarf could say a word, Tasselhoff crept out of the brush. Flint felt like tearing his beard in frustration, but under the circumstances, he could do nothing but follow. Tannis opened his eyes. It was night. He tried to speak, but was forced to pull off bits of the sticky substance that still clung to his face and mouth like cobwebs. Is everyone here? he said when he could talk. Anyone hurt? Sturm helped him to his feet. We're in a draconian camp. Tass and Flint are missing and Raceland's hurt. Poisons dart. They were in a bamboo cage near the campfire, where hundreds of draconians were milling about. What was it? A dragon! Gold Moon and Caramon knelt beside Raceland's unconscious form. Gold Moon looked up sadly. Oh, if we had the staff! Tannis saw it, lying on a blanket in front of the dragon. Reaching out, he grasped a bar of the cage. Caramon could snap this like a twig! Sturm cleared his throat. Of course, then there are the draconians and the dragon to think of. Tannis rattled the bars, and two draconian guards came over, their swords raised. One of our party is injured, he told them. We ask that you give him an antidote to the poison dart. The guards gurgled with laughter. Yes, the poison acts swiftly. <laughs> but we can't have a magic user around. And don't worry, the other added. He won't be lonely. The rest of you will be joining him soon enough. <laughs> With a roar like a wounded animal, Caramon leaped toward the laughing draconians. Bamboo gave way before him, the shards cutting into his skin. Mad with the desire to kill, Caramon never noticed. One draconian raised its sword, but Caramon sent the weapon flying. Within seconds, there were six draconians surrounding the warrior, the weapons raised. At that instant, a high-pitched, shrill voice screeched throughout the camp. Bring the warrior to me, said the dragon. Tannis felt the hair rise on his neck as a robed draconian motioned with a clawed hand. Do as the dragon says. They dragged Caramon over to the dragon, his back to the blazing fire. Near him lay the blue crystal staff, Raceland's staff, their weapons, and their packs. Caramon raised his head to confront the monster. My brother is dying. Do what you will to me. I ask only one thing. Give me a sword so that I can die fighting. The dragon laughed shrilly, and a few of the draconians joined it, gurgling and croaking horribly. <laughs> this will be fun! Let him have his weapon, the dragon commanded. Some of the draconians seemed uneasy about this. The dragon wasn't supposed to speak when the high priests were absent, but they did not dare stop Caramon as he walked over and picked up his sword. Sturm whispered in Tannis's ear, We can't let him die out there by himself. Suddenly, Flint's voice came from the shadows behind them. Shh! Tannis! The dragon is made of wicker, and it's rigged. Anyone sitting inside can make the wings flap and speak through a hollow tube. You'll never guess who's inside it, working the controls. It's Tasselhoff. Tannis gasped, listening to the dragon's shrill screeching. Tasselhoff! All right, what do we do, Flint? Get over to Caramon. Grab your weapons and packs and the staffs. I'll get Raceland into the woods. Tasselhoff's got something in mind. Just be ready. Tannis groaned, and Flint shrugged his shoulders helplessly. I don't like it either, Tannis. Trusting our lives to that rattle-brained kinder. But, well, he, he is the dragon, after all. Caramon lifted his sword. The dragon went into a wild frenzy, and all of the draconians fell back, braying. Wind from the dragon's wings blew up ashes and sparks from the fire, setting some nearby bamboo huts ablaze. The draconians did not notice, so eager were they for the kill. Suddenly, Tanish, Sturm, and Riverwind appeared at Caramon's side. 
Tanis called out to the dragon. We will not let our friend die alone. Charmon scowled at the half-elf. Get out of here, Tanis. This is my fight. Shut up and listen, Tanis ordered. When I give the signal, pick up the staffs and run for the woods. The companions retrieved their weapons. The dragon's wings gave alert, and suddenly the creature was flying, hovering in midair. The draconians cried out in alarm, some breaking for the woods, others hurling themselves flat on the ground. Now, yelled Tanis, run, Karamon! Grabbing the staffs and swinging them wildly, Karamon made it to the trees. Grabbing her staff from him, Goldmoon laid it on Raislin's chest. Flint gasped. Name of the abyss, look at that! Karamon turned just in time to see the great black wicker dragon crash headlong into the roaring bonfire. Oh, that blasted tender, he's inside there! Before Karamon could stop him, the dwarf ran back to the blazing draconian camp. Sturm had just slashed his way to the edge of the woods when Flint passed him, shouting, Tash is in there! Sturm whirled around and saw the dragon lying on the ground. Two small legs encased in bright blue leggings were sticking out of the dragon's mouth, kicking feebly. The dwarf puffed, pulling on the kender's legs as the inferno crept up the dragon's neck. Sturm drew his sword. I may cut off Tash's head, but it is only chance. The knight took a deep breath and severed the dragon's head from its neck. There was a cry from the kender inside, but whether from pain or astonishment, Sturm couldn't tell. Rushing up to them, Riverwind saw at a glance what was happening. He picked up one end of the head, Sturm the other, and together they made for the woods. Later, when they were all together, Karamon grabbed the dragon's eye sockets and ripped the head apart. Tanis jerked the kender free. Are you all right, Tash? Climbing out of the dragon's head and touching his top knot gingerly to make sure it was still intact, Tash breathed a sigh of relief and giggled. Tanis, <laughs> it was wonderful, flying like that, and the look on Caramon's face. Uh, uh, this story will have to wait, Tanis said firmly. We've got to get out of here. Smoke from the burning draconian camp hung over the black swamplands, shielding the companions from the eyes of the strange evil creatures. The trees began to creak and groan, their branches bending as a sharp wind sprang up from the north. Storm clouds! Raceland fought to speak through the smog. Hurry! We must reach Zaxaroth before the moon sets! Everyone looked up. A gathering darkness was moving out of the north, swallowing up the stars. Tanis could feel the same sense of urgency that was driving the mage. Without a word, they stumbled forward, and Riverwind led them down a trail which ended in another swampy morass. We do not have to wait again, he said. There, amidst other ruins protruding from the dank ground, lay a fallen obelisk, forming a bridge to the other bank of the swamp. On it was some form of writing. Graceland studied the spidery rooms intently. It dates from before the cataclysm. The rooms say the great city of Zaxarath, whose beauty surrounds you, speaks to the good of its people and their generous deeds. Goldmoon shuddered, looking at the ruin and desolation around her. They crossed the obelisk into a thick jungle. Riverwind bent down to study the trail. Draconians. The tracks of many clawed feet, and they lead straight to the city. Tanis looked up at the plainsman. Is this the broken city, where you were given the staff? Riverwind nodded. Where death had black wings, he said. He led them down the trail, which soon changed to cobblestones. A street, Tasselhoff called out brightly. Flint stared around in disgust. Oh, what a mess. If the greatest gift ever given to man is here, it must be well hidden. Tanis agreed. He had never seen a more dismal place. The street took them into an open paved courtyard, to the east of which a circular stone wall rose about four feet above the ground. Caramon went over to inspect it. It's a well, he announced. Well, deep at that. Well, it smells bad, too. North of the well stood what appeared to be the only building to have escaped the cataclysm. It was finely constructed of pure white stone. The temple of the ancient gods, Raceland said, more to himself than the others. How beautiful! Goldman walked toward the temple, strangely fascinated her staff clutched tightly in her hand. Mounting the steps, she entered the temple and disappeared from view as the doors closed behind her. The others, unaware of Goldmoon's absence, searched the grounds, finding nothing. Flint sat down on a broken column and turned to Raislin. Well, mage, what now, eh? Raislin's lips parted, but before he could reply, Tass yelled, 
Draconian! Everyone spun around, weapons ready. A draconian was glaring at them from the edge of the well. Tannis called out, Kill it! It will alert others! But before anyone could reach it, the draconian flew into the well. Raceland peered over the edge. He tried to cast a spell, then stopped. I can't concentrate. Must sleep. Tannis agreed. We've got to rest. Raceland huddled in his cloak and stared around. Can't you feel it? Evil, about to waken and come forth. Silence fell. Then Tasselhoff climbed up on the stone wall and peered down. Look, the draconian is floating down, just like a leaf. His wings don't flap. Behind the kinder, Tannis was staring at the well, his hands clenching nervously. Everything was too still. Then suddenly the ground trembled and a blast of cold air burst from the well. The wind swept dirt and leaves into the air, stinging their eyes and faces. Tannis tried to yell, but he choked on the foul stench. A high-pitched shriek rose from the depths of the well. Tannis was too stunned to move. Sturm dashed across the courtyard, scooped up the kender, and continued on to the trees. Caramon ran to his exhausted twin, caught him up, and headed for cover. Some monstrous evil was coming up out of the well. Riverwind stood frozen, fighting the fear that was growing within him. He couldn't find Gold Moon. He looked around wildly, struggling to keep his balance as the ground shook beneath him. Then the horror burst from the well. Riverwind closed his eyes and saw no more. This was no wicker replica. It was a living, breathing dragon. Sleek and black, the dragon rose, her glistening wings folded at her sides, her scales gleaming. Her eyes glowed red-black, the color of molten rock. Clear of the well's confines, she spread her wings, blotting out stars, obliterating moonlight. Fear, such as Tannis had never imagined, shriveled his stomach. He could only stare in horror and awe at the creature's deadly beauty. Then the dragon spoke. One word, she said, a word in the language of magic. And a thick, terrible darkness fell from the sky, blinding them all. Tannis pressed his body close against the crumbled well and covered his head with his arms as he heard the shrieking of wind. The dragon was attacking. She could not see through the darkness she had cast, but the dragon, whose name was Kisanth, knew that the intruders were still in the courtyard below. Her master, Lord Verminard, wanted the staff they carried, wanted it kept safe with her. Kisanth had waited before casting her darkness spell, studying the intruders carefully, searching for the staff. It was nowhere to be seen. Unaware that already it had passed beyond her sight, she was pleased. She had only to destroy. Knowing the intruders would be paralyzed by dragon fear, Kisanth was certain she could kill them all with one breath. She opened her fanged mouth. Tannis heard the rock splitting and bubbling. Hot liquid splashed on his hand, and a searing pain penetrated his being. Then he heard Riverwind's deep-voiced scream dying into a moan. Tannis felt the rush of a large body swoosh past him as the dragon sank back into the well, returning to its lair. Finally, there was silence. Tannis drew a painful breath and opened his eyes. The darkness was gone. The stars shone. The moons glowed in the sky. Tannis ran toward the dark form lying in the courtyard, taking one look at Riverwind's body. He choked and turned away. What remained of the plainsman no longer resembled anything human. The man's flesh had been seared from his body, and the bone was clearly visible. His eyes ran like jelly down what remained of his cheeks. But most horrible, the flesh on his torso had been burned away, leaving the pulsing organs exposed. Tannis sank down and vomited. He had seen men die by sword. He had seen them hacked to pieces. But this... Never. Sturm and Caramon came up behind him. Sturm shook his head. May the true gods have mercy. Tannis, he's still alive. I saw his hand move. Tannis squeezed his eyes shut. End it. End it, Sturm. The knight raised his blade and began to recite the ancient Salamnic death chant. Moonlight flashed on the sword blade. Then a clear voice spoke. Stop! Bring him to me! Gold Moon stood on the steps of the temple, beckoning. Both Tanis and Caramon sprang up to stand in front of the man's tortured body, knowing that Gold Moon must be spared this hideous sight. Suddenly, Tanis felt the cold hand of the mage grip his arm. 
Carry him to her, Graceland whispered. It is not for us to choose death for this man. That is for the gods. Gold Moon's face was glowing, uplifted. Come inside the temple, my friends. Come and bring River Wind to me. Gold Moon had not heard the dragon, for the doors of the temple had shut behind her at the precise moment the dragon burst from the well. In the darkness, a pale light shone. Under a dome in the center of the room stood a marble statue of singular grace. The light emanated from this statue of a woman. A strange amulet hung around her neck. Gold Moon stood in front of the statue, marveling at its beauty. But it seemed unfinished, incomplete. The marble woman's hands were curved, as if holding a long slender pole, but the hands were empty. Without thought, with only the need to complete such beauty, Gold Moon slid her staff into the marble hands. It began to gleam with a soft blue light, which grew into a blinding radiance. Gold Moon shielded her eyes and fell to her knees. A great and loving power filled her heart. You come seeking the truth, and you shall receive it. A gentle voice spoke. Dragons, once banished, again walk the land. To gain the power to defeat them, you will need the truth of the gods. This is the greatest gift of which you were told. Below this temple in the ruins rest the gleaming platinum discs of Mishakal. Inscribed on these discs is all knowledge of the ancient true gods. Find the discs and you can call upon my power, for I am Mishakal the goddess of healing. The ancient dragon Kisant guards the discs for the dragon high lord Verminard. Kisant's lair is in the ruined city of Zaxaroth below us. Take back the staff. Present it boldly and you shall prevail. The voice faded. It was then that Goldmoon heard Riverwind's death cry. <coughs> Tanis entered the temple and a feeling of peace washed over him, easing his grief and horror. What is this place? Gold Moon drew him across the shimmering tile floor until they both stood before the statue of Mishikal. This is a story whose telling must wait. As Tanis stood in wonder, Karaman and Sturm entered, bearing the body of Riverwind. Flint and Tasselhoff stood on either side of the litter. Remove the blanket, Gold Moon commanded. She gave a strangled gasp, then drew a deep breath, took the blue crystal staff from the goddess's hands, and laid it on Riverwind's body. Soft blue light filled the chamber, and everyone felt the exhaustion of the day's toil leaving their bodies. Then the light of the staff faded. Night settled over the temple, lit once more only by the light emanating from the marble statue. Tanis blinked, trying to adjust to the darkness. Then he heard a deep voice. My beloved. It was Riverwind. Tanis looked down at what should have been the plainsman's corpse. Riverwind was sitting up holding out his arms for Gold Moon. The next morning, Gold Moon showed them steps at the rear of the temple. I believe they lead to the ruined city, she told her friends. The goddess Mishikal spoke to me last night. She said that I must find the discs of Mishikal, which lie in the city below us in the dragon's lair. We must retrieve them if we are to receive the great gift the forest master told us of. Tanis walked over to the spiraling staircase. The steps were broken and covered with rotting plants and fungus. The half-elf licked his lips. Can you guide us through this place, Raceland? Raceland gazed at the stairway. As I told you in Darken Wood, I know only the legends which I heard from the wizards in the Tower of High Sorcery. During the cataclysm, when the fiery mountain struck Kryn, Zach Zeroth was cast down the side of a cliff. I recognize this staircase because it is still intact. As for beyond, who knows? I do remember that the stairs lead to the Hall of the Ancestors, the city's royal burial chamber. Now come, we must go quickly. By tomorrow it will be too late. Bah! Sturm frowned. Who can't know that? He started down the slippery stairs, moving carefully. Tanis turned to the mage. Raceland! Go with him and light the way. Caramon, walk with Goldmoon. Flint, stay with Tass. He turned to Riverwind. You were here. When you first were given the staff, you must have been. Did you come down here? I remember nothing. Except the dragon, the plainsman said. The dragon. 
How feeble the small group seemed against a monster who had sprung full-grown from Crin's darkest legends. His aunt was angry. The Draconian had brought her disturbing news. It was impossible that any of the strangers could have survived her attack at the well. Yet the Draconian now said that the strangers were in the upper part of the city and that they had the cursed staff with them. It meant only one thing. They were after the discs. That miserable staff, the dragon fumed. Verminard should have foreseen this. But no, he is busy with his war. Well, I must rot here in this dank tomb of a city. The draconian gulped. You could destroy the discs. Kissant lifted her head contemptuously. Fool! Don't you think we tried? The discs must be removed to a safe place. Inform Lord Verminar that I am leaving Zaxirath. I will join him in Park Starkus, and I will bring the intruders with me for questioning. I suppose you have sent most of the troops to the upper part of the city, where the intruders were spotted. Yes, Royal One. The Draconian bowed. The dragon sniffed in derision. Good. I can handle things here. When you find the intruders, bring them straight to me. The Hall of Ancestors was a hall of ruins. Foul-smelling mist was everywhere. Suddenly, the companions heard a thumping sound. Several squat, shadowy figures rushed past and disappeared. Caramon stared at them. Those weren't draconians. Unless they've come up with a short, fat breed. Flint sniffed. I smell gully dwarf. Sturm stopped him. Wait a minute. Gully dwarves aren't evil. What could they be doing here living with draconians? Raceland answered coolly. Slaves. They probably lived here ever since the city was abandoned. When the draconians were sent, perhaps to guard the discs, they must have found the gully dwarves and used them as slave labor. The gully dwarves were a race who lived in filth and squalor in places abandoned by most other living creatures. They were small and squat and black with filth since they never bathed. Despite their wretched appearance, however, they generally led a cheerful existence. Tanis saw in the gully dwarves a great opportunity, since nearly every slave is eager to betray its master. If the companions could win them over, the gully dwarves might lead them to the dragon's lair and the discs of Mishakal. Raistlin cast a friendship spell over the creatures, one of whom, a female named Bupu, took a particular liking to the mage. From the sack she carried on her back, she gave him a shiny stone, an emerald, saying she didn't know where the dragon lived, but that the great high bulb did. She led them down secret passages, avoiding the hordes of draconians, until they reached the ridiculously elaborate throne room of His Majesty Fudge I, leader of the gully dwarves. The High Bulb told them that the dragon guarded a huge treasure trove of precious jewels and said that he would give them a map showing how to get to the dragon's lair if they would bring him the jewels. The companions agreed. The bargain was struck, and the High Bulb gave them the map. But the High Bulb was a crafty fellow. Deciding to play it safe, he sent word to the dragon that the human intruders were on their way. The companions soon discovered the map, having been made by gully dwarves, was useless. But Raistlin correctly guessed from the emerald she'd given him that Bupu herself knew where the dragon's lair was. Bupu was forced to admit it was true. She'd found the dragon's treasure trove, but tried to hide her knowledge because she was afraid of the high bulb's anger. The companions came up with a plan. Raistlin and Bupu would create a diversion in the main square near the dragon's lair. Meanwhile, the others would sneak in and get the discs. Before leaving, Raistlin took Karaman aside to tell him there was something in the dragon's treasure trove he wanted for himself alone. It was the ancient spell book of Fiston Dantilus. When Karaman asked him if Fiston Dantilus had worn the black robes of the evil mages, Raistlin refused to answer. He stepped out into the square with Bupu, ready to begin their plan. Neither he nor any of the others noticed that two draconians followed. This is the place, 
Tanner said softly. Opening a rotting door, he stepped inside and immediately found himself up to his ankles in water. Tanner sloshed to the center of the room and held up his torch. I can see it, he said, pointing to a trap door on the floor. Flint snorted. Stand aside, he said, grabbing the iron handle. But there wasn't a creak. The door remained shut. Karaman stepped forward. He reached down into the water and heaved. There was a sucking sound, and the water drained from the room as the door opened. A four-foot shaft gaped in the floor. A narrow iron ladder descended into the shaft. Tasselhoff swung himself down onto the ladder, and the others followed, climbing slowly down into the city sewage system. Check the depth of the water, Tannis warned the kender, as Tass was about to let go of the ladder. Two feet, said Tass, heading south as Boopoo had indicated. Where's Raceland and that diversion, Sturm asked. He and Boopoo should have reached the main square by now. Tannis had been wondering that himself. We probably won't be able to hear anything down here. He hoped that was true. Rise still come through, don't worry, Caramon said grimly. Just keep moving, Tannis muttered. The tunnel soon turned east. A column of dim light filtered down from above. This, according to Bupu, was where the dragon made her lair. Douse the torches, Tannis hissed, plunging his torch into the water. They were at the bottom of a ladder that ran up to an iron grating. The grating had a simple lock that Tass opened in moments. He lifted it and peered out. Sudden darkness descended on him. Darkness so thick and impenetrable it seemed to hit him like a lead weight. Hurriedly, he slid down the ladder. It just got dark all of a sudden, he told him. No one spoke as they stood huddled in the tunnel. The dragon was up there, waiting for them. Despair, blacker than the darkness, blinded Tennis. Could the mage have betrayed them? No, damn it. Raceland was distant, unlikable, yes, but he was loyal to them. Tennis would swear it. Tennis, the half-elf, felt a firm grasp on his arm and recognized Sturm's deep voice. I know what you're thinking, but this is our only chance to get the discs. We're going, Tannis agreed. The knight was already shoving past him eagerly, his sword clanking. Sturm carefully lifted the grating and shoved it aside. Turning, he bent down to help Caramon, who was having trouble squeezing his body and his clanking arsenal through the shaft. In the name of Istar, be quiet, Sturm hissed. I'm trying, Caramon climbed over the edge. Sturm gave his hand a gold moon. We've got to have light, he said. Light? Replied a voice as cold and dark as winter midnight. Yes. <laughs> Let us have light. The darkness fled instantly. The companions saw they were in a huge domed chamber with a large altar in the center. On the floor surrounding the altar were masses of jewels, coins, and other treasures of the dead city. A black dragon perched on top of the pedestal. Feeling betrayed? The dragon asked casually. Where is Raislin? Sturm cried fiercely. The dragon snaked her great neck down and stared at them with gleaming red eyes. Then slowly and delicately she lifted one clawed foot. Lying beneath it was Raislin. Raced! Caramon roared and lunged for the altar. Stab, fool! The dragon hissed. Raceland made a weak gesture and Caramon halted. Move one step closer and I will impale this human with my claw. Tannis could see the mage's hands clench and unclench. And he knew Raceland was preparing one final spell. It could be his last. But it might give the rest of them a chance to reach the discs and get out alive. Tannis edged towards Riverwind. Lady of Quasio. The dragon said to Goldmoon. I see you hold the blue crystal staff. Bring it to me. Tannis hissed one word to Goldmoon. Stall. Obey me, ordered the dragon, lowering her head menacingly. Obey me or the mage dies. And after him, the rest. One by one. Goldmoon bowed her head in submission. She turned to Tannis and clasped the half-elf in a loving embrace. Farewell, my friend, she said loudly. Her voice dropped to a whisper. Stay with Riverwind, Tannis. Do not let him try to stop me. Goldmoon stepped back, her clear blue eyes on Riverwind, as though she would memorize every detail to keep with her throughout eternity. What is this delay? The dragon asked. I grow bored. Come forward. Goldmoon obeyed then stopped when she reached Sturm. Suddenly, 
as if the horror of the dragon was too overwhelming. She swooned slightly. The knight caught her and held her. Come with me, Sturm, Goldmoon whispered. Walk with me. Sturm nodded. Together they walked toward the dragon. Raceland's eyes were closed as he tried in vain to concentrate. Oh, I'm wasting my powers for these fools, he thought bitterly. For though he traveled with Thanos and his friends, Raceland's aims were different than theirs. Their quest was to find new hope for Krim. His quest was for power, personal power. It is not for them that you make this sacrifice, a familiar voice told him. He couldn't remember whose it was, only that it spoke to him in moments of great stress. Raceland drew a deep breath and relaxed, the spell coming easily to mind. Asto Arak Om. Then another voice broke his concentration, Goldmoon's voice. He looked at her as the words in her mind touched his mind. Graceland understood. She was telling him she had been chosen. She was the one who was going to make the sacrifice. But why had Riverwind allowed her to approach the dragon? Graceland glanced at the plainsman and saw Tannis talking to him. Tannis seemed to be consoling Riverwind. Graceland flicked his eyes back to Goldmoon. Goldmoon stood before the dragon now, her face pale with resolve. Lay the staff down, the dragon commanded her. Overcome with dragon fear, Goldmoon did not move. Sturm next to her searched the treasure trove with his eyes, looking for the discs of Mishakal. What will you give us in return for the miraculous staff? Goldmoon asked. The dragon laughed, shrill, ugly laughter. <laughs> what will I give you? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all. The dragon playfully dug her claw into Raceland's flesh, then held the claw high enough so that they could all see the blood drip from it. Give me the staff now, and your friends will be spared. Force me to take it, and they will die. The mage, first of all. Goldmoon, her spirit seemingly broken, slumped in defeat. Stern moved close to her, appearing to console her. I have found the discs, he whispered. She looked up, and Stern smiled. Goldmoon raised the blue crystal staff. We do not choose to surrender, she shouted. Before the startled dragon could react, Goldmoon swung the staff one last time, striking the clawed foot poised above Raceland. The staff shattered. A burst of pure radiant blue light beamed from it, engulfing the dragon. Kisant, mortally wounded, screamed in rage. She lashed out, fighting to escape the burning blue flame. Goldmoon fell to her knees, still clutching the broken staff. She heard the dragon shrieking and roaring above her. Then she could only hear the ringing of the staff and feel the horrible pain that engulfed her. Sturm saw the blue light slowly destroy the dragon, then it spread along the staff to Goldmoon. He took a step toward her, thinking to wrench the splintered staff from her hand and drag her clear of the deadly blue flame. But even as Sturm approached, he knew he could not save Goldmoon. Half blinded, the knight realized that it would take all his strength and courage to retrieve the discs. He tore his gaze from Goldmoon, whose face was twisted in agony, and staggered toward the treasure pile. Reaching down, he lifted up the discs, hundreds of them, made of polished platinum, bound together with a ring at the top. They were all engraved with writing and were amazingly light. Then a bloody hand encircled Storm's wrist. Help me! Grasping Raceland's hand, Sturm pulled the mage to his feet. Raceland staggered over to Caramon. Help me find the spell book, he hissed, clutching the wound in his stomach. Suddenly, a huge chunk of masonry crashed to the floor in front of the knight. The chamber ceiling was collapsing. The earth was vibrating, shaking. It was an earthquake. The dragon died, consumed by the blue flame. Kisanth had vanished, leaving behind nothing but a pile of smoldering ash. To their horror, the companions saw Goldmoon consumed as well. Nothing was left of her, not even her bones. But there was no time to grieve. Sturm looked up in alarm. The city is collapsing! Tannis grabbed Raceland's robes and dragged the mage away from the pile of treasure, where he was maniacally searching for the precious spellbook. Stop looting and get that gully dwarf of yours to show us the way out. Very well, the mage snarled. He lifted his staff from the altar. Poo poo, show us the way. He commanded the gully dwarf who emerged from the shadows. Tannis flung his arm over his face as more stone fell. He found Riverwind sobbing, moaning on the ground where Goldmoon had been, Flint and Tasselhoff trying to get him to his feet. Follow the others, he told the dwarf and the kinder. I'll talk to him. A column toppled over near him, showering him in rock dust. Just as the others were about to disappear after Buku, a huge column struck Tanis on the side of the head, nearly knocking him unconscious. 
jarred out of his grief, Riverwind picked Tanis up and carried him after the others. This whole place is caving in, Caramon shouted as he battled a pair of panicked draconians who were blocking the stairs to the Temple of Mishikau. Riverwind, Sturm, and Flint were similarly occupied. Swords flashed, daggers were drawn, axes came crashing down on draconian heads. At last, the companions succeeded in finishing off their opponents. Hordes of other draconians, along with crowds of gully dwarves, were running every which way, trying to escape as the city trembled, about to collapse completely. Run! Tanis commanded hoarsely, leaning against the pillar. Back up the stairs to the temple. I can manage. Leave me! Stern, his face grave, lifted Tanis in his arms. The others mounted the stairs as the floor tilted crazily. Together, the half-elf and the knight staggered forward, reaching the foot of the stairs, just as the remainder of the floor in the Hall of the Ancestors collapsed with a loud snapping noise. The stairs trembled and shook as the companions climbed toward the Temple of Issachal. Behind them, they could hear the thunder of surging water. The sea had claimed Zaxaroth. The dead city was now buried. Tanis emerged from the stairwell into the circular room at the back of the Temple of Issachal. The climb had been a nightmare, each new step a miracle. The chamber was blessedly quiet. The only sound, the harsh breathing of his friends who had made it that far and collapsed. He, too, could go no farther. Sturm had set down the pack containing the discs and was slumped against the wall. Graceland lay on a bench, his eyes closed, his breathing quick and shallow. Caramon was beside him. Tasselhoff sat at the bottom of the pedestal, staring up at the top. Flint leaned against the doors, too tired to grumble. Where's Riverwind? Tanis asked. He saw Caramon and Sturm exchange glances, then lower their eyes. Gold Moon is dead. He cannot live without her, Tanis, said the knight. He will not live without her. It is the way of his people. As it is of mine, we have no right to stop him. Tanis shoved them aside and pushed open the huge golden doors that led into the temple proper. Through his tears, he could see Riverwind, sword in hand, kneeling before the statue of the goddess. Tanis stumbled forward, hoping to prevent the act of self-destruction. Then, he looked again. Goldmoon lay there, sound asleep. Her breast rising and falling with the rhythm of a quiet breathing. Her silver gold hair had come loose from its braid and drifted around her face in a gentle wind that filled the chamber with the fragrance of spring. The staff was once again part of the marble statue. But Tanis saw that now Goldmoon wore around her throat the necklace that had once adorned the statue. Somehow, the power of the blue crystal staff had transmogrified her. She was restored and whole now. Luminous. Goldmoon awoke. My love, she cried, embracing Riverwind tearfully. Then she rose to face the others. I do not know how this miracle happened, she told them. But this I do know. I am a true cleric now. I am a disciple of Mishakal. And though I have much to learn, I have the power of my faith. Above all else, I bring the gift of healing back into the land. Goldmoon touched Tanis on the forehead, whispering a prayer. The half-elf felt peace and strength flow through his body, cleansing his spirit and healing his wounds. Then Goldmoon did the same for Raceland. The mage's stomach wound healed, yet Raceland continued to show weakness, coughing frequently. Though she could heal his recent wounds, even Goldmoon could not erase the damage done to Raceland's health during the tests in the Tower of High Sorcery. He may have found the ancient gods, Flint said, always the scoffer, but these discs aren't going to help much against dragons. You are right, Goldmoon said softly. I am not a warrior. I am a healer. I do not have the power to unite the peoples of our world to fight this evil and restore the balance. My duty is to find the person who has the strength and the wisdom for this task. I am to give the discs of Nishikal to that person. We must leave here, Tanis, Raceland hissed. Listen. The armies, said Tanis. War has begun. We must make haste before all of Abyssinia falls to the draconian armies. The companions fled Zaxaroth at twilight. Behind them, the temple of Nishikal stood like a lonely sentinel. Below it, the city of Zaxaroth was no more. They traveled west toward the mountains. Dead leaves blown by chill winds flew past their faces. They decided to head for Solace, planning to stock up on supplies and gather what information they could before beginning their search for a leader. 
They traveled well into the night. They saw no draconians, and supposed that those escaping Zaxeroth had traveled north to join up with the armies of this Lord Verminard, Dragon Highmaster, to serve him in his conquest of the lands of Abyssinia. The silver moon rose, then the red. The eight companions, united once again, climbed high, with Pupu leading the way. The sound of the horns drove them on past the point of exhaustion. At last, not daring to light a fire, they slept. Raceland woke in the cold gray hour before dawn. He had heard something. The sound of someone crying. Pupu, curled in a ball of misery, was blubbering into a blanket. What is it, little one? he asked. Pupu rolled over to face him. I don't want to leave you, she said brokenly. But, oh, I will miss my people. A look of infinite tenderness touched Raceland's face, a look no one in his world would ever see. Bupu, he said, you have been a good and true friend. Go back. You sure? Bupu asked anxiously. Yes, I'm sure, Raceland answered. Bupu stood up. Then I go. But first... You take gift. She rummaged around in a bag and pulled from it a book. Raislin reached out in amazement. The spell book of Vistandantilus, he breathed. I take from dragon, Pupu said. When blue light shine, I glad you like. Now I go. She slung her bag over her shoulder and turned away, her head bowed. Farewell, Pupu, the maid said softly. He held the silver and midnight blue spell book in his hands, admiring it. He longed to open it and revel in its treasures, but he knew that long weeks of study lay ahead of him before he could even read the spells, much less acquire them. And with each new spell would come more power. He sighed in ecstasy and hugged the book. Then he slipped it swiftly into his pack. The others would be waking soon. Let them wonder how he got the book. Raceland stood up, and glanced westward toward Solace. Suddenly he stiffened. Dropping his pack, he ran to the sleeping half-elf. Tanis, he hissed, pointing west. Wake up! Tanis blinked, trying to focus his eyes. The view from the top of the mountain where they were camped was magnificent. He could see the trees give way to the grassy plains, and beyond the plains, snaking up into the sky. No! Tanis choked. He gripped the mage. No, it can't be! Yes, Raceland whispered. Solace is burning. The attack on Solace had come without warning. Sitting in the inn a few nights after the companions had fled Solace with the blue crystal staff, Hedrick, the high theocrat, had risen to address the citizens. Lord Verminard wants peace. He only wants to move his armies through Solace so he may conquer Qualanesti, homeland of the elves, and more power to him. We've tolerated the elves too long. Then came a low, dull roar. The inn was plunged into darkness and a wave of heat shattered the windows. Tika looked up to see flames licking the valen wood that held up the ceiling. Hedrick ran onto the inn's front landing, then stopped, stunned. Hundreds of draconians and humans who fought with them were pouring into the city. Above them flew dragons. Five red dragons dive-bombing the town, incinerating everything as they went. That had been a week ago. The Draconians knew which buildings were essential to their needs. Only the inn, Theros Ironfield's blacksmith shop, and the general store were saved. Having been placed in charge of solace by Lord Verminard, the Hobgoblin chief, Viewmaster Toda, ordered the inn repaired immediately. The Draconians had one weakness, a thirst for strong drink. Three days after the town was taken, the inn reopened. Maybe we'll have a good crowd today. Otuk, the innkeeper, said, trying to sound cheerful. Tika's pink cheeks reddened. How can you take their money, she flared, jabbing her finger into his fat stomach. How can you laugh at their crude jokes and cater to their whims? I hate the stench of them. I hate their leers and their cold, scaly hands touching mine. Tika, please, Otuk begged. I'm too old to be carried off to the slave mines, and you're too young to die. Tika bit her lip in frustration. Otuk was right. An angered draconian killed swiftly. And without mercy. They got the bright spot, said Otik, making a bitter joke. At least Hedrick won't be in tonight. Lord Verminard had rewarded the High Theocrat's service by placing him among the first slaves to be sent to the iron mines at Pax Darkus. 
Just then, six draconian guards swaggered in. One of them pulled the closed sign off the door and threw it to the ground. You're open, he said, dropping into a chair. Yes, certainly, Ota grinned weakly. Tika? I see them, Tika said dully. Near dusk, a heavily cloaked stranger entered the inn. What will you have? Tika asked him. He answered in a soft accented voice. Nothing, thank you. I'm eating someone. More customers entered. Tika glanced at them and nearly dropped her tray. Sit down anywhere. Strangers, she called. A bearded man led the group past the draconians, who examined the group with interest. There were five men and a woman, a dwarf and a kender. More refugee scum, sneered a draconian. Wonder why they haven't been shipped out. Tika grabbed a skillet of spiced potatoes and went over to them. Thank goodness you've come back, she whispered swiftly. I knew you wouldn't forget us. Take me with you, please. Tika, calm down, Tanis told her. We've got an audience. Right, she said briskly. Handing plates around, she began to ladle out the spiced potatoes. What happened to Solace? Tanis said, his voice choked. Quickly, Tika whispered the story as she filled everyone's plate, giving Karaman a double portion. The companions listened in grim silence. Every week, Tika concluded, the slave caravans leave for Pax Tharkas. They've taken almost everyone. It all started with that captive party of elves. Elves? Tanis asked too loudly. The draconians turned to stare at him. The hooded stranger in the corner raised his head. Tika set the skillet down. I'd better go. Well, what do we do now? Flint grumbled. We come back to Solace and find nothing but draconians. All we've got are discs from some ancient goddess and a frail maid with a few new spells. Tanis rubbed his eyes with his hand. I think we should try to reach Qualanesti. Hearing the word Qualanesti, the stranger in the corner rose and started walking toward them. Tanis, company, the Kender said softly. The draconians also noticed the stranger approaching the companions. Elf. A draconian hissed, putting out a clawed foot to trip him. The hood fell back, revealing the almond eyes and slanted ears of an elf lord. The draconian shoved him against the bar. Tika grabbed one of the draconians by the arm. Let him go! Mind your own business, girl. The draconian snarled, shoving Tika aside and punching the elf. Sturm rushed forward, the others behind him, though they were too far from the elf to do any good. But help was closer. With a cry of rage, Tika brought her iron skillet down on the draconian's head. The draconian stared stupidly for an instant, then slithered to the floor. Two draconians leaped for Tika. Sturm reached her side and clubbed one of them with his sword. Karaman caught the other and tossed it over the bar. Riverwind, don't let them out, Tanis cried, seeing four hobgoblins leap up and make for the door. The plainsman caught one hobgoblin and Flint thunked another, but the other two escaped, calling loudly for the guards. We've got to get out of here, Tanis said. But at that moment, one of the draconians revived and wrapped his arms around the half-elf's neck, dragging him to the floor. Tass began flinging mugs at the attacker, narrowly missing Tannis in the process. Tannis throttled the draconian and left his body under a table. Then he stared intently at the elf. Gilthanis? His adopted brother stared at him. Tantalus, he said, using Tannis' elven name. I didn't recognize you. That beard. Horns began blasting outside. Oh, great reorks, Flint groaned. Let's go out the back. There is no back anymore, Tika cried wildly. No, said a voice from the door. There is no back. You are my prisoners. A blaze of torchlight flared into the room, and a few master totas stood in the doorway. Tanis held Stern back as he was about to charge. We surrender, the half-elf called out. Stern realized there was no glory dying in an inn trampled by stinking, flapping goblin feet. He put his weapon down. Apparently, Toda did not recognize them from their last encounter. His red eyes focused on the knight's emblems beneath Sturm's cloak. More refugee scum from Salamnia, Toda remarked. Ever since Lord Verminard invaded the Northlands, the Salamnians have been running away like rabbits. Yes, Tannis lied. No one must know how they came from the east. Toda's squinty eyes narrowed. Take their gear. The companions laid down their weapons and their packs, all except Goldmoon. Please let me keep my pack, she pleaded. I have no weapons in it, nothing of value to you, I swear. The companions turned to face her, each remembering the precious discs she carried. 
Bracefin's eyes glittered with special meaning. Remember when I touched the staff, Goldmoon? With a nod, Goldmoon put down her pack. Instantly, Raisman knelt beside the pile of weapons. A flash of light sprang from his hand. Know this, he hissed. I have cast a spell upon our belongings. Anyone who touches them will be slowly devoured by the great worm Caterpillus, who will rise from the abyss. The goblins backed away from the pile, which seemed to glow with a green aura. Get those weapons, somebody, Toda raged. You get them, muttered a goblin. Toda was at a loss. Load those prisoners into cages, he said, leering at Goldmoon and Tika. And bring those weapons, too, or you'll wish that worm was sucking your blood. The goblins began to shove their prisoners toward the door, prodding them in the back with swords. That's a wonderful spell, Raced, Caramon said in a low voice. How effective is it? Raceman smiled and held up his right hand. Caramon saw the telltale black marks of flash powder. It had all been a trick. Fearmaster Toda grinned widely as he regarded the slave caravan, now herded into a caged wagon. Lord Verminard would be pleased. The large warrior and the tall barbarian could do the work of many men, and the Lord would certainly enjoy the females. They were different, but both quite lovely. One buxom, green-eyed redhead, one slender barbarian with long silver gold tresses. A clash of steel and hoarse shouts interrupted the Fearmaster's thoughts. Suddenly... A man's agonized cry bellowed above the noise. Durthana stood up. That's Theros Ironfeld, the blacksmith. I was supposed to meet him last night. Thumaster Toda threw open the door to the companion's cage, and the goblins threw Theros inside. Hitch up the beasts, Toda yelled. We're moving out. Theros Ironfeld lay unconscious on the straw-covered floor of the cage. His right arm had been hacked off, and blood poured out from the terrible wound. The smithy's life was emptying before their eyes. He need not die, Goldmoon said. I'm a healer. Lady, Gilthani said impatiently, there exists no healer on Crin who could help this man. Goldmoon placed her hand upon Theros' forehead and closed her eyes. Miss Cal, she prayed, beloved goddess of healing, grace this man with your blessing. If his destiny be not fulfilled, heal him, that he may live and serve the cause of truth. Gilthanus stared in amazement as warmth returned to the smith's dusky black skin. His breathing grew peaceful and his flesh closed over his wound. Fortunately, the goblins hadn't noticed. Goldmoon made certain Theros was comfortable, then returned to her place beside Riverwind. Her face radiated a peace and calm that made it seem as if the reptilian creatures on the outside of the cage were the true prisoners. The caravan traveled south from Solace, down the old road to Gateway. There the prisoners strained against the bars for some glimpse of the once thriving market town. But what was left of it was melted and blackened. The captives sunk back in misery. Looking over at Gilthanus, Tanis's memories of his home in Qualanesti haunted him. Gilthanus, Lorana, and Portheos were the children of the Speaker of the Suns, the ruler of the elves. Some in the elven kingdom thought it odd that the speaker would adopt Tanis, the bastard son of his dead brother's wife. She'd been raped by a human warrior and died of grief soon after Tanis's birth. But later, as the speaker watched with unease the developing relationship between his daughter Lorana and Tanis, the half-elf, he began to regret his decision. Tanis saw the unhappiness their union would bring to his family. And so, after bitter words with Gilthanis, Tanis had left the Elven Kingdom. That was many years ago, but neither he nor Gilthanis had forgotten. At dawn on the third day, the Draconians needed a rest, so the cages suddenly rolled to a stop. Tanis and the others glanced out and saw an old man, dressed in long robes that once might have been white, and a battered pointed hat. He appeared to be talking to a tree. I, I was enjoying the sun on my back, the old man said, shaking his stick at the oak. When you, you had the nerve to cast a shadow over it. Move this instant, I say. Someone shot that loony in a cage, Thumaster Toda shouted. The old man shrieked at the draconians who accosted him. Uh, arrest the tree, obstructing sunlight, that's the charge. 
The draconians threw the old man roughly into the companion's cage. Are you all right, old one? Goldmoon asked. I'm a cleric of... Mishika, he said, peering at the amulet around her neck. My, my. You don't look three hundred years old. <laughs> kind of you to offer me a lift, though. What is your name, old one? Tika asked. The old man frowned. Uh, let's see, my name... Uh, um... Oh, <laughs> Fizban? Yes, that's it. <laughs> Fizban. Huddled in a corner of the cage, Raceland began to cough. Fizban knelt at his side. He laid his hand on the Raceland's head and spoke a few words. Caramon heard only phrases. Fizbanden. And not the time. Raceland's breathing eased. You are magi, he whispered. The old man shrugged. Why, yes, <laughs> I suppose I am. Raceland struggled to sit up. I am magi too. His band seemed immensely tickled. <laughs> a small world, Crin. <laughs> I'll have to teach you a few of my spells. I have one, uh, 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 a fireball. Let's see. Uh, how, how did it go? The old man rambled on. On the fourth day, just before dawn, the caravan was ambushed by elven archers. In the panic, the prisoners were able to free themselves, with the help of one of Toda's slaves, a gully dwarf named Seston, whom Tasselhoff had befriended. Fizban nearly incinerated them with his fireball spell, but at last the prisoners managed to escape into the woods of Qualinesti, where they were greeted by Portheos, Gilthanus's elder brother, and now the crown prince of Qualinesti. Portheos told them that in the face of invasion by the dragon armies, the elves planned to flee Qualinesti in a matter of days. Hearing of Goldmoon's miraculous healing of Theros Ironfeld, Portheos brought the companions to the beautiful rose quartz and crystal city of Qualinost. There, they were summoned to the palace of the Speaker of the Sons, Gilthanus and Portheos's father. It had been many years since Tanis had seen his adopted father. There were now lines of care and sorrow in his face, which had once seemed untouched by time. My sons the speaker said brokenly, and Tanis was startled at this show of emotion. Tantalus, we welcome you back to your homeland, though I fear you come in its final days. We shall not keep you long. Gilthanus? The young elf lord stepped forward. The raid on Pax Darkus? I failed, Gilthanus said softly. We were joined by a group of human resistance fighters we met along the way, but by the cruelest mischance, we stumbled into the advance patrols of the dragon army. I lost consciousness after a blow to the head. When I awoke, druids in the woods tended my injuries. Eventually, I came to solace. Lord Verminard was executing all his elfin prisoners there. I was about to join my poor fellows when this man rescued me. He put an arm around Theros Ironfeld. Theros would have paid for his kindness with his life had this woman not healed him by a miracle. Staring at Goldmoon's medallion, the Speaker of the Suns gasped. It has been three hundred years since the symbol of Mishikal was seen here. I must consider what this means to us. For now my daughter Lorana will guide you to a place where you can rest. Tonight we'll hold a banquet in your honor, for you bring us hope. May the peace of the true gods go with you. An elf maiden walked forward to stand beside the speaker. All sighed at her beauty, even Raceland. Her hair was honey pouring from a pitcher. It spilled down her back. She had the delicate, refined features of the elves and large, liquid eyes that changed color like leaves in flickering sunshine. Welcome, honored guests, Lorana said shyly. Please follow me. Lorana led them to a sun-dappled grove in the very center of the city. Here, though surrounded by buildings and streets, they seemed to be in the heart of the forest. Lorana gestured toward fruit trees and told the companions to eat their fill while elf maidens brought big baskets of fragrant bread. The companions washed in a nearby brook, then returned to relax on soft moss beds, all except Tanis. Refusing food, the half-elf wandered around the grove, absorbed in his own thoughts. When he suddenly threw down an apple and disappeared into the trees, Lorana excused herself from her guests and followed. 
Now I'll find out what's going on, Tasselhoff said to himself, slipping after them. He came upon Tanis standing alone beside the stream as Lorana emerged from another trail. Tantalus, she called. As Tanis turned, Lorana flung her arms around his neck, kissing him. Oh, she said teasingly, that horrible beard. Tanis gently pushed her away. Lorana, no, he began. Don't be angry, Lorana pleaded. I'll learn to like it. You are my betrothed, remember? You wear my ring. Tanis looked down at her, his eyes tortured. We were children, playing a game, Lorana. Now I'm... I'm in, I'm in love with someone else, a human woman. Her name is Kitiara. Lorana stared up at him, and all the color drained from her face. Tanis took off his ring of golden ivy leaves and handed it to her. I release you from any promises you made to me, Lorana. And I ask you to release me. Lorana looked at him pleadingly. Then, seeing only pity in his face, she let out a cry and flung the ring into the bushes. It fell at Taz's feet. He picked it up and slipped it into a pouch. Well, the kinder said to himself, now at least I know what's going on. The morning after the elven feast, the speaker called his high council together. We cannot stand against Lord Verminard and his dragons, he announced. According to the legends of the ancient dragon wars, it was only with his fabled weapon, the dragon lance, that the mighty knight humor defeated the Queen of Darkness and her evil dragons. There are none now who remember the secret of that great weapon. Fizban started to speak, but Raceland hushed him. Therefore, we must abandon Colonesti, the speaker continued. We had planned to go west to return to the ancient elven home. Then we learned of a third dragon army at Pat's Darkest, less than a day's journey from us. Unless that army is stopped, I fear we are doomed. Tanis stepped forward. Do you know a way to stop that army? Yes. It is our belief that if the women and children prisoners were freed from Pax Darkus, the men who served the Draconians as slaves would turn on their masters and could flee into the southern mountains. The dragon army would then be called back from its march on Colonesti, allowing us time to escape. Riverwind stared hard at the speaker. Seems to me you... Throw the humans to the dragon armies as a desperate man throws hunks of meat to pursuing wolves. The speaker shook his head sadly. Lord Verminard will not keep them alive much longer, we fear. The iron ore is nearly gone. Will you and your companions go with Gilthanis and lead the raid, Tantalus? Gilthanis knows a way into Pax Darkus, the Sla Mori, the secret way. It's a labyrinth lying beneath the fortress. Gilthanis can lead you through it and into the fortress. Tanis regarded his friends. Then we must separate. Tika, Goldmoon, Riverwind, Caramon, and Raceland. You go with the elves. The discs are too precious to risk on a raid into Pax Darkus. Raceland shook his head. It is not among the Qualanesti elves that Goldmoon will find the one she seeks. The leader who can help us defeat these dragon armies. Tika stepped forward. I'm going with you, Tanis. I plan to become a swordswoman like Kitiara. Tanis winced at the mention of Raceland and Karaman's half-sister. The woman he loved and yearned to see again was off somewhere, fighting on behalf of some new lord. Again, Tanis wondered who that new lord could be, and wished Kitiara could have been with him now. How they could have used her fighting skills. Riverwind folded his arms. I won't hide with the elves. He and I are one, Goldmoon added. Tanis? Flint said firmly. We're all going with you to Pax Tharkis. The half-elf bowed his head in submission. Fizban let out a sigh. Oh, oh good. <laughs> now we can get some sleep. Wait a minute, old one, Tanis said sternly. You're definitely going with the elves. The old mage stared at Tanis with a penetrating gaze. I go where I choose, and I choose to go with you, Tanis. Half-elven... Raceland gave his arm to Fizban, and the two of them walked off. As if one crazed maid wasn't enough, Flint muttered. I'm going to bed. Tanis felt a strong hand on his arm and looked up to see Caramon, gesturing for him to come away. The warrior led the half-elf to a large oak where Sturm stood waiting. Caramon's face was flushed, and he stared at his feet. There is one problem, Tanis. I don't trust your fairness. 
and neither did Sturm or Raist. If Gilthanus was so endangered in solace, why was he sitting at the inn? Sturm broke in. Maybe Verminard told him he'd spare his people if he betrays us. Ridiculous, Tannis snapped and stared accusingly at Caramon. If there's anyone I don't trust in this group, it's your brother Raislin and that old man Fizban. The big man grew pale and began to turn away. Tannis put his hand on the warrior's arm. I didn't mean that, Caramon. Raislin has saved our lives more than once on this insane journey. It's just that it... I can't believe Gothanis is a traitor. We know, Tannis, Sturm said quietly, and we trust your judgment. But... It's too dark a night to walk with your eyes closed, as my people say. Tannis nodded. He put his other hand on Sturm's arm. The knight clasped him, and the three men stood in silence, then left the grove and walked back toward the others. Tannis woke with a start. A dark shape crouched over him in the night, blotting out the stars overhead. He yanked the person down across his body, putting his dagger to the exposed throat. Lorana, he gasped. What are you doing here? Tantalus, she said, choking. Come with us. Don't throw your life away at Pax Darkus. Even my father doesn't believe this will work. I can't lose you and Gilthanus, too. Lorana, he said, gripping the elf maid. There comes a time when you've got to risk your life for something you believe in. I've come across proof that the ancient gods are still with us, Lorana. That those gods are true gods who can lift Kryn out of the despair it's fallen into and bring hope to the people. How can I shrink from death in the face of something that big? If I lose my life helping to bring knowledge of these true gods to the creatures of Kryn, my death will have been worth it, and my life will have meant something. Can you understand that? She looked at him through her golden hair. Yes, Tantalus, she answered softly, her thoughts hidden. I understand. In the morning, Gilthanus presented Tika with some of his mother's armor, made of tough leather, and handed out rations to the raiding party. Caramon picked up some of it and made a face. What's this junk? he asked. Quit, Pa, Gilthanus told him. It will last us for many weeks. Looks like dried fruit, Caramon said in disgust. Tanis grinned. That's what it is. Dawn was just beginning to tinge the wispy storm clouds with pale, chill light when Gilthanus led the party out of Qualinost. The trail led down from the aspen woods to the pines of the lowlands. When they stopped for a hasty lunch, Fizban came over and hunkered down beside Tannis. Someone's following us, he whispered. Tannis stared at the old man incredulously. Gilthanus stood up. Bah! That's insane! Let us go now! The Slamori is still miles away and we must be there by sundown. They walked on through the ragged pines. The sun slanted in the sky, lengthening their shadows, when the group came suddenly to a clearing that had been the site of a recent bloody fight. Bodies of men and hobgoblins lay scattered about in obscene postures of brutal death. A low moan came from beneath two bodies. Caramon shoved them to one side. It was a human. The group gathered round to examine the man. He wore chain mail of good quality and his hair was thick and black. The stranger stared up blearily. Thank the seeker gods. Gilthanus. Gilthanus started in surprise. Aben, how did you survive the battle at the ravine? How did you for that matter? The man named Aben staggered to his feet. Caramon reached out to help when suddenly Aben pointed. Look out, draconians! The companions whipped around to see twelve draconians standing at the edge of the clearing, weapons drawn. You will come with us to the dragon, High Lord, one of them ordered. Tannis stepped forward. We don't take orders from Verminard. The creatures gurgled with laughter. <laughs> Soon you will. Raceland saw Fizban pull something from his pouch. No, Fizban, the mage cried. No fireball. You'll torch us all. The old mage sighed, then brightened. Uh, I'll think of something else. Uh, uh, now, wh 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 what was that web spell? Uh... Tika her new sword drawn and ready, trembled with fear and excitement. A draconian rushed her, and she swung a tremendous blow. The blade missed the draconian by a mile, and Caramon's head by inches. Pulling Tika behind him, Caramon knocked the draconian down with the flat of his sword. Before it could rise, he stepped on the creature's throat, breaking its neck. Two other draconians charged Caramon, but Raceland was beside him now, the two combining magic and steel to destroy their enemy. 
Sturm and Tannis fought side by side. Gilfanis made an unlikely team with Flint, while Tasselhoff used his sling to send a deadly barrage of rocks whizzing onto the field. Goldmoon stood beneath the trees as Riverwind fought. As for the old magician, he was flipping through a spellbook. A web, web, uh, 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 now how did that go? Suddenly Tasselhoff shrieked. Tika, behind you! The former barmaid whirled around to see a draconian, launching into the air straight at her. With a strength born of terror, she hit at the creature with her shield, knowing she had to kill it. She kept bashing and bashing until she felt Karaman's hand on her arm. It's all right, Tika, they're all dead. The relieved girl flung her arms around the warrior's neck and out of sheer relief kissed him. A few long seconds later, she realized what she was doing and backed away, blushing. The fight was over. Aben turned to Gilthanus. Where are you headed? he asked. The elf lord looked the swordsman over. Our journey is secret, but I suppose we could use an expert swordsman. Aben clasped the elf lord on the shoulder and reached out to shake Tannis's hand. My name is Aben Shatterstone, all of you. As long as you're fighting draconians, your fight is my fight. Just then, Fizban interrupted. Uh, that's it. <laughs> yes, I remembered. <laughs> Suddenly, the air was filled with strands of sticky cobweb. Some magician you are, Flint grumbled as everyone laughed. By sunset, the group had reached an open plain edged by tall mountain peaks. Commanding the pass was the gigantic fortress of Pax Tharkas, home base of Lord Verminard. Standing between elven and dwarven kingdoms, it had been built by both races together in a spirit of friendship long since lost on Kryn. Now it was the bastion of a mighty war machine. As the companions stared in awed silence, the huge gate in front of the fortress swung open. An army of draconians, humans, hobgoblins, and goblins marched out into the plains heading for Qualinesti. That night, as the companions camped outside the secret entrance to the Sla Mori, they heard a noise in the brush. Someone was following them. But in spite of a thorough search, their crafty pursuer could not be found. Nerves were on edge, with Aben and Gilthanus accusing each other of disloyalty while the other wasn't listening. Nevertheless, the next morning, they entered the Sla Mori together. The dark passageway led them first into the burial chamber of Kithcanan, the ancient king of the elves. The robed skeleton of the elven king sat enthroned, holding his enchanted sword, which none dared touch. Suddenly, the companions were attacked by a gigantic slug, which spat its saliva at them, meaning to kill and eat them. In the midst of their desperate defense, Lorana appeared. Out of love for Tanis, she had pursued them all the way from Kwalinost. She was the secret follower. Tanis was furious that she had put her life in danger, but had no time to chide her. The slug was closing in. As the companions cowered behind the throne, with even Raistlin and Fizban's magic unable to deter the slug, a skeletal hand placed the enchanted sword in Tanis's hand. With it, he was able to beat back the slimy slug. Only afterward did Tanis realize who had given him the sword? The dead king, Kith Kanan himself. When at last he turned to Lorana to berate her for following him, she countered with his own words. There came a time when a person had to risk his life for something he believed in. Tanis believed he had a mission to fulfill, a mission given him and the companions by the true ancient gods, and Lorana believed in her love of Tanis. There was no sending her back now. Gathering their courage, they pushed on into the Sla Mori. The corridor came to an abrupt end. Crumbled stone and rubble lay beneath a hole in the rock wall, and the sense of evil flowing from beyond could almost be felt. They entered the hole cautiously, the light from Raceland's staff illuminating the darkness. Soon they were in a round room, about a hundred feet in diameter, in the center stood a crooked column. Flint examined it. Well, that's a huge chain. Gilthanus gasped. We're in the chain room. The companions stared at the monstrous column of links in wonder. 
Each link was as long as Caramon, and as thick as an oak tree. Gothanus pointed to the iron bracket in the floor. If this chain is released from its moorings, massive blocks of granite drop down behind the gates of the fortress. Then no force on Kryn can open them. He pointed to a faint outline of a door on the north wall. This must be the entrance. Raceland waved his hand. I warn you, do not open that door. Gothanus stared at a chipped stone at the bottom of the wall. The way to Paxdarkas is through a secret door, he murmured. Then he reached down and pulled out the chipped stone. The door swung silently inward, revealing a room nearly filled with yellow brick-like objects. Aben stared in open-mouthed wonder. We found the treasure of Kith Kanan. We... His voice trailed off in horror as something took shape before his eyes. It is the spirit of a dark elf, Raceland hissed. I warned you not to open that door. Put up your weapons, fools. You cannot fight her. A touch is death. Run. Run, all of you. Even as they retreated back into the chain room, the darkness took shape, coalescing into the coldly beautiful, distorted features of a female drow, an evil elf of ages past. The spirit advanced toward them. Tannis held the door open for the companions. Is that everyone? No time to look, Raceland cried. Shut the door, brother. Caramon threw his weight on the door. It slammed shut with a boom. That won't stop her, Raceland told them. I can cast a spell on the door, but it will weaken me greatly. I suggest you run. Perhaps I can stall her. Tannis gritted his teeth. Riverwind, take the others on ahead. Sturm and I will stay with Raceland and Caramon. The others crept down the dark corridor, looking back in horrible fascination. Raceland stood with his hands on the door, but the dark elf's power drained his concentration, making him forget the spell. Then, from somewhere inside him, came a voice he had heard only twice before, in the Tower of High Sorcery and on the altar of the Black Dragon in Zaxarath. Raceland shouted aloud, in a strong voice that was not his own, Kalisan, Budrunin, Kara Emarath. From the other side of the door came a wail of disappointment. The door held. The mage collapsed, drained by the casting of his spell. Carrying him, Caramon joined the others, and they groped their way back along the dark passage. They found another door, which opened easily to Flint's hand, and they emerged in a large open room filled from ceiling to floor with stacks of wooden crates labeled Solace and Gateway. Gilthanus looked around grimly. This is it. We're inside the fortress itself. We're in Pat's darkest. Tannis sank onto the floor in relief, the others slumping down beside him. It was only then that they noticed. Fizban and Tasselhoff were missing. Afterward, Tasselhoff could never clearly recall those few panicked moments in the chain room. He remembered saying, A dark elf? Where? Then strong hands grabbed him, lifting him up into the air. Climb the chain! shouted a voice beneath him. Tasselhoff felt the cool metal of the chain and began to climb. He wondered how he would find his friends again, and for a moment he felt discouraged, wondering if they had escaped. Then he heard Fizban muttering, and he cheered up. He wasn't alone. Uh, we, we could use some light, couldn't we? Uh, let, let's see. Uh, uh, light? Uh. <laughs> Soon, a small puffball of bluish-yellow flame appeared, hovering near the magician's hat. They were at the top of the fortress. The chain ran up over a huge cogwheel, mounted on an axle set in solid stone, and disappeared into a tunnel. Taz crawled from one tooth to another. Fizban, his robes hiked up around his thighs, followed with amazing agility. Can you get some light up here? The kinder asked. Uh, light to the tunnel, Fizban commanded. <laughs> the glowing puffball whizzed up, dancing near Taz. The kinder crawled forward, wondering what it would feel like to splatter all over the floor, hundreds of feet below. As Fizban followed, Tass crawled to the tunnel entrance, then jumped off the chain onto the stone floor five feet below him. Pulling out a handful of quithpa, the dried fruit rations the elves had given them, Fizban sat down and began to munch. My stomach tells me it's, it's lunchtime. Tass joined him, and the puffball flame settled on the brim of the magician's hat. Tass sniffed. Ah, uh, Fizban... 
Your hat's on fire. Far below, Flint wiped his hand across his eyes, glared at Tannis, and hurled himself onto the floor, sulking. Tannis shook his head firmly. Flint, I feel as badly as you do about losing them, but we cannot go back. The companions were resting, eating quithpa, and drinking water from a well they discovered. Feeling his strength return, Tannis rose and walked toward Gilthanis, who was studying a map intently. Where are we, Gilthanis? he asked. The elf lord pointed to the map. Here is the fortress of Pax Darkis. We're in the cellars. About fifty feet away are the women's quarters. Here is the lair of Pyros, Verminard's dragon. Here is the children's prison, guarded by Flamestrike, another red dragon. Verminard knows the women would never leave without their children, and the men wouldn't leave without their families. The men work out here, in the mines under the mountain. Aben scowled. You seem to know a lot about Pax Darkus, Gilthanis. There was a long silence. Sturm, Caramon, and Aben regarded Gilthanis warily. Three humans united in their mistrust of an elf, Tanis noticed. He motioned to Gilthanis to continue. Every evening, a few women leave their cells to take food to the men. My warriors and I plan to disguise ourselves as women, go out to the men, and alert them to be ready to rise up and make their escape. Lord Verminard and Pyros will certainly leave to join the army tomorrow. That's when we go into action. The group agreed the plan seemed viable. Pushing open the door leading to the hallway, they heard drunken draconian laughter from the room directly across from them. Silently, the companions slipped into the dark corridor. Tasselhoff and Fizban were walking up and down the tunnel, crawling in and out among the myriad chains, when they spotted a thin sliver of light through a crack in the floor. They knelt down and peered through the crack. Below them was a large room, furnished with every possible luxury. The kender sucked in his breath in awe. Look there! That must be Lord Verminard and his dragon! Pyros was an ancient and enormous red dragon. He had been sent to Verminard by the Queen of Darkness as a gift, and to keep an eye on the High Lord. Pyros had another mission as well, to search this part of Ancelon for one man. The Queen of Darkness called him Everman. The dragons called him the Green Gemstone Man. His human name was Barum. It was the search for Barum that brought Pyros to Verminard's chambers now. Fumaster Toda was bringing in two prisoners for interrogation. Barum might be one of them. Pyros was stretched out along one side of the enormous throne room his huge wings folded. Dozing, he snorted and shifted slightly. A rare vase toppled to the floor with a crash. Verminard looked up from the desk where he was studying a map of Qualanesti. Transform yourself before you wreck the place. The gigantic red dragon began to shimmer like a mirage, condensing into the shape of a human male, slight of build with dark black hair, a thin face, and slanting red eyes. Dressed in crimson robes, Pyros the man walked to Verminard's side and stared at him with undisguised loathing. The High Lord was an imposing figure. Tall and powerfully built, he wore dark blue dragon scale armor, trimmed in gold. The hideous mask of a dragon High Lord concealed his face. There was a scratch at the door, and a guard admitted Fumaster Toda and his two prisoners. Verminard studied them. Seeing that neither of them matched the descriptions of those who had raided Zak Tsarath, he scowled behind the mask. Pyros reacted differently. Shaking with excitement, it took a great effort to force himself to appear outwardly calm. Only his eyes, burning with a devouring flame, gave a hint of his inner elation. One of the prisoners was a gully dwarf, Seston, in fact. After the prisoners had gotten away, Toda, needing someone to blame, had had the gully dwarf arrested. The other prisoner, the one Pyros watched, was a human male, dressed in rags, who stood staring at the floor. Verminard stepped forward. Why have you bothered me with these wretches, Fumaster? The hobgoblin kicked Seston. This miserable gully dwarf freed the slaves I was bringing you from Solace, and this human prisoner was found wandering around the town of Gateway. Verminard snorted. Throw them into the mines with the rest of the rabble. 
Coda stammered. I thought the human might be a spy. I believe he's deaf and dumb, my lord. The dragon high lord studied the human intently. He was tall, about fifty human years old. His hair was white, and his clean-shaven face brown and weathered. There was certainly nothing unusual about him, except for his eyes, which were bright and young. His hands too were those of a man in his prime. Verminard waved his arm. Have the gully dwarf fed the pyros tonight, and take your deaf and dumb spy to the mines. Pyros ground his teeth and cursed Verminard for a fool as Toda led the human away. Verminard approached Pyros and said, "We fly tomorrow morning to destroy Qualanesti. Be ready when I call." When he had gone, Pyros, still in human form, began to pace back and forth. There came a scratching at the door. Pyros was irritated. Lord Verminard has gone to his chambers. He snorted. A draconian peeked in. It is you I wish to see, Royal One. The traitor has been successful. He was able to slip away only for a moment, but he has brought the cleric of Nishikal, the woman Gold Moon. Pyros didn't care about the cleric, but there was much more at stake. I must meet with our treacherous friend. Bring him to me tonight in my lair. Do not inform Lord Verminard. He might meddle. Pyros rubbed his hands together, smiling. In the women's prison far below, the companions, now dressed as women, waited for the moment when they would put their plan into action. Caramon giggled. Slapping Aben's face as the fighter playfully slid his hand up the warrior's voluminous new skirt, the women in the room laughed heartily at the men's antics, but Tanis glanced nervously at the door, afraid of arousing suspicion. Merida saw his worried gaze and assured him the guards had all been drunk ever since the army moved out. Tanis relaxed, though he had known Merida only a few hours. He already relied on her judgment. She was the one who had calmed the terrified women when the companions had burst into their cell. She was the one who listened to their plan and agreed it had possibilities. She convinced the women to go along with the plan, as long as no harm came to the children. Tanis told her he couldn't guarantee the children's safety because the raiders might have to fight a dragon. Even though he was sure Pyros had gone off with the armies attacking Qualanesti, Tanis knew another red dragon guarded the children's quarters. Merida had laughed. Fight a dragon? You mean old Flame Strike? <laughs> There's no need to fight that pitiful creature. The children love her. She's more than half mad. Her own offspring were killed in some war or other, and now she's got it in her head that our children are hers. Besides, she always sleeps late in the morning. The afternoon had passed swiftly. It was now time to go. Raislin, coughing up blood, said he was too weak to accompany them. He had to sleep. Then there was the sound of clawed feet outside the cell, and two draconian guards, smelling of stale wine, stepped inside. Get moving. There was no choice but to leave Raislin behind. The others followed the guards. Meanwhile, high in the upper reaches of the fortress, Fizban and Tasselhoff had found what they were looking for. The old mage clapped his hands as part of the wall in the mechanism room swung open. Well done, my boy. You, you found the way out of here. Tass started to crawl through the secret door he just sprung, then helped Fizban through. They were in a small hallway that ended abruptly, not forty feet away, in a flight of stairs descending into darkness. Double bronze doors in the east wall provided the only other exit. Pushing gently, Tass easily opened the double doors and entered cautiously, followed closely by Fizban and the puffball flame, which seemed to have a life of its own. Hmm, looks like some sort of art gallery. Fizban quickly searched the place, looking for one particular painting. Ah. Here it is. Tass came over to see. Why, it's a painting of dragons, red dragons like Pyros attacking Tax Tharkas, and. Ikenda's voice died. Men, knights of Salamnia, mounted on other dragons, were fighting back. The dragons the knights rode were beautiful gold and silver dragons. Suddenly, Tasselhoff understood. There were good dragons in the world who could help fight the evil ones. And there were dragon lances that could kill the evil dragons. 
The magician nodded. Yes, little one, <laughs> you see the answer, and you will remember. But not now. <laughs> no, not, not now. Reaching out, he ruffled the kender's hair with his gnarled hand, chanting in the words of a spell as he did so, a spell of forgetfulness. Tass looked up in confusion. What was I saying? Dragons? Oh, oh yes, I think the dragon's lair was over this way. The old magician shuffled along behind, smiling. Meanwhile, the companions, dressed as women, were escorted to the underground rooms where draconian guards locked the male slaves at night. The guards then left to keep an eye on the gully dwarves above. Goldmoon rose to address the slaves. Speaking in clear, dulcet tones, she told them of Riverwind's discovery of the blue staff of healing and how it killed a dragon. She pleaded with them to join the revolt against their oppressors and take a chance at gaining true freedom. She spoke of the ancient gods and the truths they'd given in the discs of Mishikau. When she was finished, the men seemed bewildered, not knowing whether to believe her or not. Then Hedrick, the high theocrat from Solace, began denouncing Goldmoon as a witch and a charlatan. Arguments started, with men shouting back and forth. Quickly, Tannis posted Caramon, Flint, Aben, Sturm, and Gilthanus at the doors, fearing the guards would hear the disturbance. Lorana joined Tannis. These humans are fools. How can life be worth anything living like this? A feeble, white-haired man answered her from the pallet where he lay. That's a good question. Bring the barbarian woman over to me. Tannis looked at Moretta intently. He's Elistan, Moretta explained, a high seeker from Haven. He was the only one who spoke out against this Lord Verminard. But no one listened. Tannis brought Goldmoon to the ailing cleric. Elistan looked up at her. Young woman, you claim to bring word from ancient gods. Why have they waited so long to make their presence known? Goldmoon knelt down beside him. Imagine you are walking through a wood, carrying a rare and beautiful gem. Suddenly you are attacked by a vicious beast. You drop the gem and run away. Afterward, you are afraid to go back into the woods and search for it. Then someone comes along with another gem. Deep in your heart, you know it's not as valuable as the one you lost, but you're still too frightened to go back to look for the other. Now, does this mean the gem has left the forest? Or is it still lying there, shining beneath the leaves, waiting for you to return? Elistan closed his eyes, sighing. Of course. The gem waits for our return. I wish I had time to learn of your gods. Goldmoon took his hand. He will be given time. Tannis, absorbed in the drama before him, started in alarm when he felt a touch on his arm. He turned around to find Sturm and Caramon standing behind him. Sturm whispered in his ear, Aben and Gilthanus are gone. Night deepened over Pax Darkus. Forcing himself to relax, the dragon Pyros cast a glance at Seston, the gully dwarf, who was cowering in the corner. Not yet hungry, Pyros laid down upon the floor and waited. The door opened, and a hooded figure came in. Remove the hood, the dragon commanded. I would see the faces of those I deal with. The figure cast his hood back. Up above the dragon, on the third level, came a strangled, choking gasp. Pyros considered flying up to investigate, but the figure interrupted his thoughts. I have only limited time, royal one. I must return before they suspect. The dragon stared at the traitor contemptuously. In due course, what are these fools plotting? They plan to free the slaves, lead them in revolt, forcing Verminard to recall the army marching on Qualanisti. That's all? The dragon snarled. Yes, royal one. Now I must report to Lord Verminard. The dragon leaned forward. Do not worry about Verminard. I will see he learns of this when I am ready. Much greater matters are brewing. Now listen closely. A prisoner was brought in today by that imbecile Toda. It is he, the one we seek. However, I am unable to take him to the Queen just now. Even if the war is just a ruse, Verminard cannot deal with Qualanesti without me. 
I'll take the Everman to the Queen when time permits. In the meantime, you must keep him safe. It is a measure of a dark magician's power that the cleric of Mishakal and the man of the green gemstone arrive together within my reach. I will allow Verminard the pleasure of dealing with the cleric and her friends tomorrow. But when the slaves attack, find the green gemstone man. Bring him here and hide him. When the humans have all been destroyed and the army has wiped out Qualanisti, I will deliver him to my dark queen. The figure bowed again. And my reward? It will be all you deserve. Now leave me. The man withdrew. Fizban and Tasselhoff sat crouched by the balcony. Taz shook his head. Sorry I choked like that. It's hard to realize someone you know would betray you. Fizban sighed. So, uh, uh, what do we do now? Tass was miserable. I don't know. We can't warn Tannis and the others because we don't know where they are. You know, when I was little and wanted to be big like the humans, my father told me Kendra was small because we were meant to do the small things. He said that all the big things in the world were really made up of small things, all joined together, and that it's the small things that make the difference. The Kendra's pointed chin jutted forward, his lips tightened. We'll leave the big things to the others. They'll manage. We'll do the small thing, even if it isn't very important. We're going to rescue Seston. Aben was back in the cell when the companions returned. I heard something, Tannis, so I went to investigate. There was a draconian crouched outside the cell door listening. I knifed it. His story appeared to be true. Tannis had seen the body of a dead draconian when they returned to the cell. Tika got a clean cloth and washed Aben's face. He saved our lives, Tannis. Caramon scowled, then went over to Gilthanis, who had also returned. What about you, Gilthanis? Why did you leave? Gilthanis' face hardened. You don't want to know. But seeing the others staring at him, he reluctantly told them. The truth is, I returned to see if our mage was really as exhausted as he said. He must not have been. He was gone. Raceland entered just in time to hear Gilthanis' words. The maid spoke, his voice soft and lethal with hatred. If you believe I am a traitor, kill me now. I will not stop you. Caramon went to his brother. You'll have to kill me too. Tannis felt sick inside. Someone was lying, and he knew it. They'd already been betrayed. Tannis saw it all with sickening clarity. Verminard would use the revolt as an excuse to kill the hostages. He could always get more slaves. Gilthanis's plan played right into the Dragon High Lord's hands. We should abandon it, Tannis thought wildly. Then he forced himself to calm down. No, the slaves were too excited. Following Goldmoon's miraculous healing of Elistan and his announced determination to study these ancient gods, the people again had hope that the dragon armies could be defeated. If we back out now, they'll never trust us again, Tannis thought. We must go ahead. Besides, perhaps there was no traitor. With that thought... He fell into a fitful sleep. Dawn filtered through a gaping hole in the tower of the fortress. Tass blinked, then sat up, rubbing his eyes, wondering for a moment where he was. He hadn't meant to fall asleep. He and Fizban had only been waiting until the dragon slept to rescue Seston. Now it was morning. The Kend appeared over the balcony. The dragon and Seston were still asleep. Now was their chance. Old one, wake up. We have to rescue Seston right away. Can you magic him up? Fizban closed his eyes. Concentrating, he murmured eerie words, then stretched his thin hand through the railing of the balcony and began to make a lifting motion. Guided by Fizban's hand, Seston floated peacefully up and over the balcony, coming to rest on the dusty floor, still asleep. The gully dwarf opened his eyes and sat up in alarm. Seston, it's me, Tasselhoff. You're safe, but don't say a word. Fizban pointed to the second level, where Verminard stood on a ledge overlooking the dragon. Pyros, awaken, the High Lord commanded. That cleric is here, inciting the slaves to revolt. Pyros stirred and slowly opened his eyes. He supposed he would have to deal with this now after all. Do not trouble yourself, my lord. Then both he and Verminard stopped moving abruptly, staring at a strange object drifting down through the air, gently as a feather. 
It was Fizban's hat. They were being spied upon. Before dawn, Tanis woke everyone and set the plan into action. They would sneak into the children's room and lead them into the courtyard. The male slaves would overcome their guards, and then all the prisoners could escape to the safety of the mountains to the south. But a snag developed in their plans. The door to the children's quarters was barred by draconian guards. The guards tried to search the women, among whom were the disguised companions. Quickly, Karaman, Sturm, Flint, Aben, and Tanis overcame the guards, killing them silently. Meanwhile, Pyros was chasing Fizban, Tasselhoff, and Seston through the corridors of the fortress. Fizban's hat had alerted Pyros to the presence of spies, and he had set off in pursuit. These spies knew of the green gemstone man. They must die. Time and again, Fizban was able to cast spells to prevent the dragon from incinerating them. Finally, the kender, the mage, and the gully dwarf leaped onto the great chain, meaning to shimmy down to safety. At last, Pyros saw his chance. With a breath of pure white heat, the evil dragon melted the chain, and Fizban, Tass, and Seston fell toward the stone floor far below. In the darkness, free of the chain that had held it in place for centuries, the great cogwheel gave a groan and began to turn. In the room next to the children's cell, Marita's torch flared yellow. Tannis caught his breath, awed at the massive size of the enormous red dragon, flame strike. It was, however, in pitiful condition, its head lined and wrinkled with age, the skin mottled, the teeth yellowed and broken. The dragon's eyes opened, slits of glistening red in the torchlight. The companions halted, hands on the weapons. Flame strike spoke in a sleepy, husky voice. Uh, is it time for breakfast already, Marita? Uh, yes, we're just a bit early today, dearie, Marita replied soothingly. Go back to sleep. I'll see they don't wake you. The dragon yawned and opened her eyes a bit further. I don't mind. Tana saw that one eye had a milky covering. The little ones had a restful night. Little Eric's cold is better. Her eyes closed. The companions were about to proceed when the noise started. At first, Tannis thought it was his imagination, that his nervousness was making him hear a buzzing sound in his head. But the sound grew louder and louder, like a thousand swarming locusts. Now the others were looking back too, all of them staring at him. Suddenly, Raceland broke from the group and ran back to Tannis. The sword! Tannis stared down at the sword in its antique scabbard. The blade was humming, as if in the highest state of alarm. I remember now, Raceland whispered. The sword the dead king Kithkanen gave you in the Slamori is the enchanted sword called Wormslayer. It is reacting to the presence of the dragon. The dragon blinked her eyes open, focusing on Tannis in irritation. Her voice was filled with menace. I smell steel. These are not the women. These are warriors. Tannis drew his sword, but Marita grabbed him. Don't hurt her. The blade began to shine with a brilliant white light. I may not have any choice. Flamestrike shrank back. The light of the sword pierced her good eye painfully. The sound went through her head like a spear. Whimpering, she huddled away from Tannis. Run! Get the children! Tannis yelled. They didn't have to fight, not yet anyway. Marita led Goldmoon to the children, who were wide-eyed with alarm over the strange sounds outside their room. Gather your things, children, Marita told them. Move very swiftly through the dragon's lair in the playroom. The big man, she gestured to Caramon, will lead you out into the courtyard. Your mothers are waiting for you there. The children quickly did as they were told, begging Tannis as they passed not to hurt their dragon. Goldmoon tried to reassure them. Children, Tannis will not hurt the dragon if he does not have to. You must leave now. Your mothers need you. The children called out their goodbyes to Flamestrike as they followed Caramon. Stern stayed behind. Tannis, the old dragon's going to kill you when the children are out of danger. Yes, Tannis answered grimly. I know. Already the dragon's eyes, even the bad one, were flaring red. Saliva dripped from her mouth, and her talons scratched the floor. Sturm drew his sword, but Raceland stopped him. Leave us, knight. Your weapon is useless. I will stay with Tannis. The knight hesitated, not sure he could trust the mage. Go, Sturm, Tannis said. 
They need you out there. When the night was gone, Tannis turned to Raislin. Can you buy us some time? Raislin smiled the smile of one who knows death is so near it is past fearing. I can. Move back near the tunnel. When you hear me start to speak, run. The dragon rose as Tannis retreated, knowing only that her children were gone and that she must kill those responsible. Then darkness descended upon her, so deep that she thought she had lost the sight of the other eye. She howled, sucking in a great breath to burn the warriors. But before she could breathe her fire upon them, she heard another sound. The sound of her children. No, I dare not burn them. I might hurt my children. They're still nearby. Please, please don't hurt my children. Tannis dragged the weakened mage down the tunnel and into the playroom. Caramon swung the huge doors open to the rising sun, and the children raced outside. Tannis could see Tika and Lorana, standing with their swords drawn, looking their way anxiously. A draconian lay on the floor of the playroom, Flint's battle-axe stuck in its back. As they rushed outside, they heard the roar of a very different dragon. Pyros had discovered the spies. Tannis swore bitterly. Pyros! He's still there! Tasselhoff, clinging uselessly to the snapped chain, thought to himself as he fell through the dark void toward the floor below, this is how it feels to die. Above him, he could hear Seston shrieking in terror as he too fell. Below, he heard the old maid muttering to himself as he fell, trying one last spell. Then Fizban raised his voice. Feather Fizz! The word was cut off with a scream. There was the sound of a bone-crushing thud as the old magician crashed to the floor. Within a few seconds, Tass realized he, too, would be dead. Then he was surrounded by millions and millions of feathers. Poor Fizban, Tass murmured. His last spell must have been featherfall, the one Raceland used to use to make himself float down through the air. Wouldn't you know it? Fizban hit before he could finish the spell, and instead of getting a feathery fall... He just got a bunch of useless feathers. Above him, the cog wheel turned faster and faster. Out in the courtyard, chaos reigned. The companions gathered around Tannis. Run for shelter, he instructed. Verminard and the dragon didn't leave. It's a trap. The others, their faces grim, nodded. All of them knew it was hopeless. The men of the mines, seeing their families free, quickly overpowered their guards and began running toward the courtyard. That wasn't the plan. Where's Aben? Tannis yelled at Sturm. Last I saw him, he was running toward the mines, he began. They both gasped in sudden realization. Of course, said Tannis softly. It all fits. Aben's the traitor. And he's led us into a trap. As Aben ran for the mines, his one thought was to obey Pyros' command. Somehow, he had to find the green gemstone man. Seeing the chance to do Verminard another favor, he had told the men that Tannis wanted them to meet him in the courtyard. Seeing their families free, the men had surged forward blindly. Aben scanned the crowd anxiously, then decided to look inside the prison cells. There, he found the man sitting alone, staring vaguely around him. Hearing Aben call his name, Barum looked up. He was not, as Tota had assumed, deaf and dumb. He was, instead, a man totally absorbed in his own secret quest. Aben licked his lips nervously. He had to get Baron out of here before Tannis caught them. But where? There was only one place Aben could take him and be safe from both Tannis and Verminard. Outside the walls of Pax Darkus. Aben helped Baron rise to his feet. There's going to be fighting. I'm going to take you away, keep you safe until it's over. I am your friend. Do you understand? The man regarded him with wisdom and intelligence. It was not the ageless look of the elves, but of a human who has lived in torment for countless years. Barum sighed and nodded. Verminard strode from his chamber in a fury, yanking at his leather-armored gloves. A draconian captain trotted behind. How long does it take to capture a handful of spies? The draconian's eyes glinted. We are forty or fifty, my lord. Against over six hundred men and women. If they ever get organized and escape into the mountains, bah! Pyros! Verminard called. He heard in another part of the fortress a heavy metallic thud. Then he heard the cog wheel of the great chain, unused in centuries, creaking with protest at being forced into labor. 
The dragon High Lord ran to the ledge as Pyros dropped past him. He climbed swiftly onto the dragon's back. Though separated by mutual distrust, the two fought well together. Their hatred of the petty races they strove to conquer, combined with their desire for power, joined them in a bond much stronger than either cared to admit. Fly! Verminard roared, and Pyros rose into the air. Sturm and Tannis stood at the northern end of the courtyard, about twenty feet from the front gates of Pax Darkus. Looking south, they could see the mountains and hope. Behind them were the great gates of the fortress that would at any moment open to admit the vast Draconian army. Then, like a blood-red flaming comet, Pyro soared from the fortress of Pax Darkus, his huge tail trailing behind him. Upon his back rode the dragon High Lord, the gilded horns of the hideous dragon mask glinting in the morning sun. Dragon fear spread over the people. They were frozen before the terrifying apparition. Tannis felt Sturm grip his arm. Look! Tannis saw two figures running toward the gates. Aben! But who's that with him? Sturm and Tannis raced after the two men. Catching up, Sturm grabbed Aben and hurled him to the ground. Drawing his sword, Sturm jerked Aben's head back. Traitor! Though I die this day, I'll send you to the abyss first! Suddenly, Aben's companion whirled around and caught hold of Sturm's sword arm. Sturm gasped. His hand loosened its grip on Aben as the knight stared, amazed at the sight before him. The man's shirt had been torn open. Impaled in his flesh, in the center of his chest, was a brilliant green jewel. Even Raceman gasped in awe. Barum covered his chest. Then, loosening his hold on Sturm's arm, he turned and ran for the gates. Aben scrambled to his feet and stumbled after him. Sturm leaped forward, but Tannis stopped him. It's too late. We have others to think of. Sturm pointed above the huge gates. Tannis, look. A section of the stone wall of the fortress began to open, forming a huge widening crack from which massive granite boulders began to fall. Above the roar was the sound of the massive chains releasing the mechanism that would cause the wall of the fortress to crash in upon the gates. Boulders began to fall just as Aben and Barum arrived at the gates. Aben shrieked. The man next to him glanced up and sighed. Then both were buried under tons of cascading rock as the ancient defense mechanism sealed shut the gates of Pax Darkus. I offered you a chance to work for my queen, Verminard roared. Now you will all pay with your lives. At a touch of the dragon High Lord's hands, Pyros leaped high into the air. The dragon drew in a deep breath, preparing to swoop down upon the terrified former slaves and burn them to ashes. But the dragon's deadly dive was stopped. You will not destroy my children! A crazed flame strike screamed as she flew out of the fortress, sending boulders everywhere. In her mind, it was the final battle where knights riding silver and gold dragons slew her children. Pyro, stunned by the unexpected attack, swerved just in time to avoid the broken, yet still deadly teeth of the old dragon. Flame Strike hit him with a glancing blow, tearing painfully into one of the heavy muscles that drove the giant wings. Rolling over in the air, Pyro lashed out at the passing Flame Strike with a wicked taloned forefoot, tearing a gash in the female dragon's soft underbelly, knocking her backward. But Pyros had forgotten his rider. Verminard lost his grip and fell to the courtyard. He landed, bruised and momentarily shaken. Glancing around, he saw the captive people fleeing toward the safety of the mountains. Then he noticed four men who did not move. Verminard studied the four as they approached him. These were the ones who defeated Kisanth and Zaxerath, escaped the slave caravan, and broken into Pax Darkus. Overhead, the two dragons fought furiously, Dragon blood rained down upon them. Verminard would have to face the four alone. This will be an interesting fight, he thought, fingering his mace, Nightbringer. He swung it in an arc, keeping them back, forming his plans. Then he sprang forward, taking them by surprise. Landing on his feet, he grasped Raceland's shoulder, whispering a swift prayer to his dark queen. Raceland screamed, his body pierced by unseen, unholy weapons. He sank to the ground in agony. Caramon sprang at Verminard, but the High Lord was prepared. Caramon's bellow changed to a shout of panic as the spellbound mace blinded him. Tannis, help me! I can't see! With a laugh, Verminard struck Caramon a solid blow to the head. The warrior went down like a felled ox. Verminard whirled, blocking Tannis' sword with Nightbringer's massive oaken handle. For a moment, the two combatants were locked together. But Verminard's greater strength won out, and he hurled Tannis to the ground. Sturm raised his sword in salute, a costly mistake. 
It gave Verminard time to remove a small iron needle from a hidden pocket. Raising it, he called once more upon the Queen of Darkness. Sturm suddenly felt his body grow heavier and heavier until he could walk no more. Verminard lifted the mace in a gruesome mockery of the knight's salute, then aimed for the knight's head. Suddenly, a hand caught Verminard's wrist. The hand of a female. Goldmoon's hand. He felt a power to match his own, a holiness to match his unholiness. At her touch, Verminard's concentration wavered, his prayers to his dark queen faltered. Sturm felt the spell leave his body. He saw Verminard turn his fury on Goldmoon, striking at her savagely. The knight lunged forward, seeing Tannis rise. Both men ran toward Goldmoon, but Riverwind was there before them, pulling her out of the High Lord's reach. At that moment, Verminard knew he was alone. Too late, he realized that his mask, never intended for hand-to-hand -hand combat, was blocking his peripheral vision. He struggled to rip the dragon helm from his head. But just as Verminard's hand closed over the visor, the magic blade of Kit Kanan, wielded by Tannis, pierced his armor and slid into his back. The dragon high lord screamed and whirled in rage, only to see the Salamnic Knight, Sturm Brightblade, appear in his blood-dimmed vision. The ancient blade of Sturm's father plunged into the high lord's bowels. Verminard fell to his knees, and darkness overtook him. Overhead, a dying flame strike heard the voices of her children crying to her. She was confused and disoriented. Pyro seemed to be attacking her from every direction at once. Then the big red dragon was before her, against the wall of the mountain. Flame Strike saw her chance. Pyros breathed a great blast of flame into the face of the ancient red dragon. He watched in satisfaction as the head withered, the eyes melted. But Flame Strike ignored the flames that blinded her and flew straight at Pyros. The big male was taken by surprise. Even as he breathed again his deadly fire, he realized with horror that he had no place to turn. Flame Strike had maneuvered him between herself and the sheer face of the mountain. Both dragons slammed against the mountain. The peak trembled and split apart as the face of the mountain exploded in flames. Below, the people heard Flame Strike's voice calling just before she died. My children. The last day of autumn dawned clear and bright. The air was warm as it had been since the refugees fled Pax Darkus. With the dragon armies blocked from the gate by the toppling boulders, they had had precious days to escape into the safety of the mountains. There, in a hidden valley discovered by Flint, they could wait out the winter. It would be months before they were discovered. The people built shelters and rejoiced in their escape. And at sunset, on the last day of autumn, they celebrated the wedding of Riverwind and Goldmoon. When the vows and rings had been exchanged and the merriment had begun, Tannis and Sturm sat side by side, talking quietly. Tannis's eyes strayed occasionally to Lorana. She sat at a different table with Elistan, who had conducted the ceremony. How changed she was. Sturm touched his arm. Tannis started. He had lost track of the conversation. Hush, don't move. Look over there, Tannis. See him? Sitting by himself? Tannis looked where Sturm gestured. And he saw the man, sitting alone, eating his food absently. Whenever anyone approached, the man shrank back until they passed. The half-elf gasped and dropped his fork. But that's impossible. You saw him die with Avon. No one could have survived. Then I was right, Stan said. You recognize him too. Let's go talk to him. But when they looked again, Baron was gone. Swiftly, they searched the crowd, but to no avail. As the silver and red moons rose in the sky, the married couples formed a ring around the bride and groom and began singing wedding songs. Tannis lingered on the outskirts, watching his friends. Where was Graceman, he wondered. Tannis decided to search for him. The company of the dark-souled mage seemed better suited to his mood than music and laughter. Tannis found Graceman, sitting on the stump of an old tree whose lightning-shattered remains lay scattered on the ground. A small shadow settled among the trees behind the half-elf. It was Tasselhoff, spying on their conversation. Finally, Tass thought, he would hear what these two discussed. Graceland's strange eyes stared to the south, at a gap in the tall mountains. What do you see to the south? Tannis asked abruptly. Graceland glanced at him. 
Queen of Darkness is not defeated. The half-elf stared hard at the mage. Do you see no hope? Graceland shook his head sadly. Hope is the denial of reality, Tannis. How will you fight the dragons? For there will be more, more than you can imagine. And where now is humor? Where now is the dragon lance? No, half-elf. Do not talk to me of hope. Tannis did not answer, nor did the maid speak again. Tasselhoff sank back into the soft grass. No hope, he murmured bleakly. I don't believe it. But ever since the death of Fizban, a change had come over the kinder. Tasselhoff began to consider that this adventure was in earnest, that it had a purpose for which people gave their lives. Until now, it had never occurred to him that all this might be for nothing, that they might lose people they loved, like Fizban, and the Dark Queen would still win in the end. Still, Taz told himself softly, we have to keep trying and hoping. That's what's important, the trying and the hoping. <sighs> Maybe that's most important of all. Something floated gently down from the sky, brushing past the kinder's nose. Tass reached out and caught it in his hand. It was a small, white chicken feather. And to Tasselhoff, it meant hope. has been a Random House audiobooks presentation. We hope you have enjoyed this audio program. Look for the complete trilogy of the Dragonlance Chronicles available on audio cassette from Random House.